Good morning. Welcome to the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor for the 81st legislative session. Before we begin, please be sure to mute your microphone when you're not speaking to minimize the background noise. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Hardy. Here. Senator Lang. Here. Senator Neal. Here. Senator Pickard. Here. Senator Scheibel. Here. Senator Settlemeyer. Here. Chair Spearman. Here. And let, let the record show that all members are present. Welcome to our audience joining us remotely and anyone listening over the internet. Today we are, will have a hearing on Senate Bills 186, 252, and 386, and Senate Joint Resolution 11, and a work session on Senate Bills 44, 289, and 290. I want to take a moment to just go through some basic housekeeping items. Uh, the legislative building, as you know, is closed so that we can reduce the spread and infection rate of COVID-19. And that simply means that everything that we're doing, the committee, staff, and everyone else, we are meeting virtually, uh, where you can join us either on uh, line, uh, on Nellis, or you may submit comments uh, if you'd like to uh, speak, or you may look at us, you may watch the committee meetings on YouTube. Um, we just want to make sure that you have a way to continue to connect with us throughout this process. Uh, before you speak, you must, you must register though online. You'll be asked to fill out a form, your name, uh, telephone number, what you wanna speak on and your position on the bill. And when the uh, broadcast person calls on you, please be paying attention because they will call on you on the last three digits of your phone number. Just a note that while meeting registration is required to participate, it does not guarantee you will be able to speak. Similar to sessions when we were in person, public comment and comment may be limited due to time constraints. And I will announce the time frame. That is how many minutes for each response, for, against, and neutral. It will be helpful if more than one person in an organization wishes to comment, comment to remember ditto is a good response when someone has already covered your points. And this will allow more people to comment during that time frame. As I said before, please pay attention uh, when you are listening and you are going to be speaking. Pay attention uh, and listen for the last three digits of your phone number. Detailed instructions for participating in committee members are also available on the help page, which is linked in the banner at the top of every page on Nellis. If you need any assistance with any of these processes, or if you would like to receive electronic notification of the committee's agendas and meetings and minutes, please contact our committee staff at the email listed on the agenda. Any exhibits for the committee must be submitted in electronic format no later than 8 a.m. the day before to our committee staff and contact information is found on the committee page on Nellis. In addition, any person proposing an amendment to a bill being heard by this committee must first talk to the sponsor and let them know that you intend to submit an amendment. I will not entertain amendments if the bill sponsor is not aware of the amendment. The proposed amendment must be submitted in writing 24 hours prior to the meeting. Please include the bill number, statement of intent, and your contact information. When testifying, please remember to unmute your microphone and clearly state your name and the entity you represent at the beginning of the testimony. Please speak clearly and project your voice to ensure those watching remotely can hear your testimony. Please remember to turn the microphone off when you finish speaking. Just a reminder to all who testify pursuant to Nevada Revised Statutes 218E.085, it is unlawful for a person to knowingly misrepresent facts when testifying before a legislative committee. A person who knowingly does so is guilty of a misdemeanor. The chair or any member of this committee may ask for documentation supporting your testimony. Committee members, remember that during this virtual uh, process. We will be doing votes using roll call and the secretary calls on your name. Please answer yes or no so that there is no confusion. And if you have a question, please make sure you raise your hand through the Zoom application and we will make sure that we call on you. Additionally, 
we only have about uh, 54 hours before uh, the passage, the first House committee passage, uh, which is April the 9th. So I'm urging all those who are presenting or who have presented, if you have a committee in this bill and you're waiting on an amendment to be finalized, please, 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 so that you get that, bring that to the attention of the committee staff so we can get your bill uh, heard with the amendment and uh, if possible, make sure we get it voted out of committee. Committee. And finally, all exhibits received prior to the meeting will be available on Nellis online. And so now let us begin our work session on Senate Bill 44. Mr. Magarejo. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Magarejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, Senate Bill 44 uh, was heard on March 8th and it was sponsored uh, by this committee on behalf of the Rural Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board and revises provisions governing behavioral health professionals. Um, we did uh, review these amendments in committee last Friday. I will note there's only one uh, or two changes from last Friday's work session document, which is we remove the provisions from amendment number one that uh, proposed a, um, a discount for initial licensing for those that serve uh, BIPOC and LGBT communities. Uh, I will turn your attention to amendment number 10, which is the last amendment on this uh, work session document. <clears throat> and it proposes to add new sections to the bill to amend chapter 641, 641A, 640, 641B, 641C of NRS to require the applicable boards to adopt regulations to reduce the total cost for renewing a license for providers who submit documentation demonstrating that the provider uh, primarily serves Nevada residents, serves group of patients or clients, uh, the majority of whom are recipients of Medicaid and their Medicare, and actively serves as an employee of a public or nonprofit organization whose clients are more than 50% members of underserved populations, including without limitation, underserved populations of black, indigenous, and people of color and LGBTQ uh, plus communities. And those were all the amendments. Thank you. Um, committee members, any uh, comments, questions bill before us? Yes, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I have a question on Amendment 10, um, the, the sub for the Nevada residents where um, it looks like a lower a lower cost license would be given to um, a Nevada resident and not to an out of state. And I just and I know I uh, tried to catch Will before. I just wondering because because to me it struck me as is this a I call it P and I but a privilege and immunities issue where we're discriminating against out of state citizens because I'm not really understanding. What's the what's the what's the reason for why we're saying Nevada residents get a lower price versus an out of state if the goal is to find qualified people, then okay, but that doesn't mean that I I mean typically when you have clauses like that, there's a stated need shortage. Um, it's temporary until the shortage is fixed. Um, it is not forever. I'm, I'm trying to simplify it without getting all legalistic. Too late. <laughs> Mr. King, can you answer that question, please? Thank you, Chair Spearman. Uh, for the record, Will King, Committee Council. Uh, as I read um, item 10 on the work session document in our 10A, uh, it's not in-state residents who get uh, lower fees. Um, anybody can get that lower fee. It's who the uh, applicant or licensee, I guess these are just renewals, so it would be licensee. It's who the licensee is serving. They're serving in-state people, but the Privileges and Immunities Clause would apply to people who are trying to get employment here in Nevada. So uh, the Vice Chair is right. If we were saying that Nevada residents get a lower fee, that, that would be questionable under the Privileges and Immunities provision. But because it's the same price for everyone um, or the same reduced price for everyone, regardless of their residency, um, 
there's not a privileges and immunities problem. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Keene. Additional questions, committee members? Uh, yes, Senator yes, Madam Chair. I uh, uh, actually, it's not surprising, I guess. I had the same question. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I had reached out to uh, a friend of mine who's a constitutional lawyer, uh, uh, former professor at uh, UNLV Law, and uh, asked the question because I wanted to make sure I was solid in my understanding. Um, and if the, uh, uh, the two pieces were the uh, potential protectionism, which would probably fall afoul of uh, uh, the uh, uh, North Carolina Dental Board versus um, uh, uh, FTC case. And then there was another case in uh, New Mexico recently that dealt specifically with this. Uh, interestingly, they uh, had uh, found that in the North or in the New Mexico case that it was a uh, as applied uh, standard, um, and then uh, the race conscious um, uh, uh, portion uh, may uh, um, uh, may play Hobbs with this bill. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Keene, uh, I, I wonder if you're familiar with the New Mexico case and, and the North Carolina uh, Dental Board case and, and uh, uh, if the as applied um, uh, provision would uh, also affect us, meaning that uh, if the uh, bulk of the practitioners that are, are uh, uh, meeting the criteria. I mean, we can always write criteria that seem uh, neutral uh, as to residents, but if there are no uh, applicants outside the state, and so it's an as applied standard, uh, if it wouldn't uh, still uh, be considered to run afoul of P and I. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure he's familiar with those cases. So, Mr. Keene, can you answer that question, please? Thank you, Chair. Spearman, for the record, uh, Will Keene, Committee Counsel. Uh, the, the North Carolina case is not applicable here uh, simply because we're, th there's nothing here about preventing non-licensed people from engaging in any particular practice. As you remember, the North Carolina case was about the dental board preventing non-licensed dentists or people who are not licensed dentists from engaging in teeth whitening. Um, right. so, that's, so that's not applicable here. Um, as to the privileges and immunities, and the as applied standard that you were talking about, I suppose it's possible that there won't be any non-residents who possibly could qualify here. However, um, for example, in Nevada, you, you could have people who are Utah residents who live close mm -hmm. to the border or Arizona live close to the border or even somewhere in California live close to the border who, who easily could meet this standard even though they're not Nevada residents. Um, and so at least at, least at this point, uh, since we don't we don't have any statistics for an as applied analysis because this law hasn't been passed yet, um, it would seem to me that in theory there's not really a, a problem with as applied. Um, and you had a lot of questions in there. I, I'm if I missed no no no. I, I I was just trying to frame the question. I I think you've addressed it. I, these were my concerns as well, and and uh, uh, particularly given the uh, uh, nature of the the colloquy that's included now in the history, um, I had some questions. So I wanted, I reached out to uh, someone who litigates in this area and, uh, um, uh, but obviously he didn't have the benefit of sitting through the hearings. So I uh, just wanted to kind of touch on it as well. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, um, Senator Pickard, not, not addressed to you, but um, <clears throat> to anyone who is uh, sponsoring a bill or related at all to anything that happens, legislation that happens here in um, Nevada, uh, what we have to do is our final arbiter is LCD. Uh, so uh, and you're probably right, Senator Pickard, maybe you didn't listen to the uh, hearing, uh, but we have to go with what LCD says. Thank you for the question. Any additional questions? I don't see any hands or did I miss someone? Additional questions, anyone? Okay. Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. I'm sorry, motion. I'll accept a motion. Do pass. 
So moved. Senator uh, Lang. I have a motion from Senator Lang. Do I have a second? Second from Senator Scheibel. I have a second from Senator Scheibel. Additional questions or discussion? Thank you. Now, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy. No. Senator Lang. Yes. Senator Neal. Yes. Senator Pickard. I'm going to vote no, but uh, I may change by the time it gets to the floor. Thank you. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Senator Settlemeyer. Nope. Chair Spearman. Yes. Show that the motion does carry, and I'll take the floor statement for this one. Let's go now to work session on Senate Bill 289. Mr. Magarejo. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Spearman. For the record, says our Magarejo Committee Policy Analyst. Our next bill is Senate Bill 289. Uh, which revises provisions relating to workers' compensation. It was sponsored by Senator Harris, and it was heard on April 2nd, uh, 2021. Uh, I will uh, review the amendments. However, I will go slightly out of order, as there is one amendment that we will ask uh, Mr. Jason Mills, who's on the Zoom, to, to further clarify. Uh, the First Amendment is to amend subsection 3 of section 1 to include that the documentation of records must provide specific references to one or more of the following. Uh, amendment number 3 is amend subsection 5 of section 1 to add if there is no physical evidence of a prior surgery and if to provisions concerning when the percentage of present impairment must not be reduced by any percentage of the previous impairment. Amendment number four is amend sections two, four, six, and 10 to include that if requested, an insurer may provide to a claimant a certain documentation by electronic transmission, the proof of sending and, re and receipt of which is readily uh, verifiable. Amendment number five is amend subsection 1B of section five to prescribe the cost that may be awarded to a claimant. In addition, add a new provision to subsection one to limit the costs to the cost to the costs incurred due to the litigation of the issues which uh, were decided in favor of the claimant. In addition, delete subsection six of section six, which defines cost as it is ascribed in Nevada Revised Statutes 18.005. Amendment number six to amend subsections two and three of section five to provide that a claimant shall serve a memorandum of cost not clear, not later than 15 calendar days after the decision and not later than 15 calendar days of receipt of a memorandum, the insurer shall issue a determination, respectively. In addition, amend some sections 3A and B to provide that the costs allowed are pursuant to NRS 161C.335, uh, subsection 1, subparagraph B, not NRS.110. Uh, amendment number seven is to amend subsection 11A of section seven to provide that an insurer shall commence making installment payments to an injured employee not later than the date specified in subsections eight or nine as applicable. Amendment number eight is to amend section eight to retain the provisions proposed to be eliminated, which provide that a claimant who elects to receive and accept payment for a permanent partial disability in a lump sum terminates and waives certain rights of the claimant. Amendment number nine is to amend subsection uh, two of section eight to add a, a new provision to include that a claimant who elects to receive a lump sum does not waive the right to conclude or resolve any contested matter other than scope of the claim, a stable and uh, rateable status or average monthly wage, which is pending at the time that the claimant signs the election of method of payment and lump sum. The next amendment is amend subsection 2 of section 9 to require that an insurer must include at least three vocational rehabilitation counselors who are employed by separate organizations or entities. Uh, amendment number 11 is to add new sections to the bill to amend NRS 616C, NRS 616C.040, and NRS 616C.095, and NRS 616C.098 to allow a physician assistant or vast advanced practice registered nurse to file a claim for compensation for an industrial injury or occupational disease. In addition, adding new provisions to NRS 
C.040 subsection 3 to allow a claim for compensation to be signed with the original electronic signature or the injured uh, of the injured employee and the treating physician or chiropractor or PA or APRN to whom the duty to file a claim for compensation is delegated. I'll turn back to amendment number two in the work session document, which is uh, what we we're asking Mr. Mills to provide for further clarification, which is to add a new subsection to section one to authorize the rating doctor to portion the rating under certain conditions, provided the doctor can meet the requirements of subsection two. Uh, Madam Chair, those are all the amendments. Thank you. Um, I believe Mr. Mills is on to explain, uh, is it section one sub four? Yes, Madam Chair, Jason Mills, Nevada Justice Association. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Please Thank proceed. you, Chair. Uh, with regard to that particular amendment uh, that they're referring to, uh, this was what we worked with the, uh, the parties, including NSIA, uh, Nevada Resort Association, Employers Insurance Company of Nevada. Specifically, they wanted the ability, and we think that is correct, that if there's no actual documentation that exists, uh, but there is evidence of surg prior surgical intervention that notwithstanding the lack of documentation, the proof of actual surgical uh, uh, um, evidence would allow the apportionment provided that the doctors comply with the other requirements of subsection two, uh, which is basically indicating that there is there would have been a result of an impairment of prior to the current injury based upon the surgery that there's no documentation for. I, I hope that clarifies for LCB and the uh, committee. And if I if there are any questions, I would be happy to entertain them. Thank you, sir. Committee, any questions? Senator Settlemeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. I was just curious on section nine uh, on the draft I'm working on page 30. And I apologize if I'm not following it real well. We just unfortunately got these amendments pretty late in the game. I appreciate though the sponsor, Senator Harris, working with all the parties. I know there's been a lot of work and compromise on this particular bill and I'm very appreciative of that. That's how the process should work. Uh, but I'm just curious myself on page 30, section nine, it says it include, must include at least three vocational rehabilitation counselors who are employed by separate organizations or entities. And I'm just curious, is that statewide, national-wide? I just wanna make sure that we have enough of these individuals to fulfill said requirement. That's my only concern. So how does the bill address that particular concept? Jason Mills, Nevada Justice Association, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Settlemeyer. Uh, sir, that provision basically was uh, implemented in that so that there are at least one counselor available to each industrial or claimant, but that those counselors be employed by different entities, essentially to encourage um, competition. What we were seeing was three counselors being offered by one company, if, if that makes sense, sir. I appreciate that, Mr. Mills, and uh, very much. But again, all these counselors then have to be licensed in the state of Nevada in order to be applicable, correct? Yes. So, that, um, uh, go ahead. Yes, Senator. That That is current law, and those uh, vocational counselors are currently licensed here in Nevada. Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, then, do you have an idea of how many vocational counselors we have that are from separate organization entities within the state. I just want to make sure that we have enough out there, you know, like by factor of 10, do we have at least like 30 of these individuals in order to fulfill this requirement or are there only four in the entire state and we're in trouble? No, first of all, I don't know that if there are more than 30, but there are certainly more than three. So there are definitely um, vocational counselors that are not just with one company that are a separate company. So for example, there's some companies that have more than three or four or five. Some companies just have one. Some companies have two or three, but I'm aware of at least a dozen in the state that I've worked with in the past. Okay, that gives me a lot of comfort. Thank you for that, Mr. Mills. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I, Mr. Mills. And I don't know if this is a a good question or not, but I'm I'm on the sub four section one sub four piece on the, the prior surgery acting as proof. So when I go back and look at um, section two, I'm trying to understand like how that, how, how it works in between. And so my first thought was how, it, let's say the doctor doesn't rate the person appropriately and the, the individual is just like, well, I have proof of my prior surgery, which shows X. What, how do they, how do they appeal or how do they, how do they, push back on the rating, not clear. Yes, Jason Mills, Nevada Justice Association, through you, Chairman Spear to Vice Chair Neal. Um, what would happen Mr. in that- Mills, Just go direct, go direct, okay? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, direct to you, Vice Chair Neal, Jason Mills, Nevada Justice. Um, so what would happen, Senator, is um, the concern that was in play was that, for example, a person you could have, say, a prior spinal fusion surgery, for example, right? Uh, say you had it in another state decades ago in another country. Um, if you were to take an x-ray, clearly you can see the, the hardware that exists in this person's back, right? You could see the surgical scar. But if there was no documentation, and this was the concern that employers, uh, gaming, Nevada self-insured had was the lack of documentation shouldn't be a basis to not allow apportionment when there is clear objective proof of a prior surgery. We thought that was insightful and reasonable because you can literally look at an x-ray right now and you can see if someone's got hardware in their body, you can see the surgical scar. So what the rating doctor would then do uh, by a preponderance of the evidence, and that would be evidence that he or she would then rely upon, right? The x-ray that shows the hardware or the surgical scar. And then say under the fifth edition guidebook, this particular surgery would have been a, I know I'm getting in the weeds, but say a category four impairment on the spine, which would have been a 20% impairment. And then he or she would then be able to remove or subtract from the workers' compensation award that pre-existing surgery, despite no documents that were in place because sometimes these documents go away so that and that's and it's why that is reasonable is because everyone can kind of see it it can be objectively identified that a surgery took place and when these surgeries take place a lot of the times in the guidebook the ama fifth edition guides that's required to be used in our state for workers compensation injury claims um that it's they're, they're, they're more easily quantifiable, these prior surgeries, uh, just by what's in the guidebook for a rating doctor to then apportion out or subtract out. This is not something that isn't already currently done. We just wanted to make it clear for all parties that the, the, the lack of documentation when there's a s obvious surgical uh, uh, prior surgery that took place, that that wouldn't bar an apportionment in favor of the employer or the insurer because clearly there was a surgery here and, and we, we we happen to concur that that's a fair assessment or or correct so so madam chair quick since this is a new new section so so it, this bill passes is this retroactive if a person um realizes that now this law is in play and this gives clarity to a situation they were in to then go back and reopen a claim to get it reviewed under that section, that subsection? Vice Chair J, uh, Neil, Jason Mills, Nevada Justice Association. Um, it, it only applies to current open claims, right? So if a claim has already, has already been closed, uh, Senator, it wouldn't apply. But however, if they reopened their claim under existing law, this new provision would then apply because the claim is now reopened and it applies to open claims. Thank you. No, Madam Chair, that was it. I mean, I'm not trying to have a rehearing. 
Mr. Neil, this is Cesar Magrejo. Uh, Trish Pierman is, is having some IT issues, and she asked if okay. you could Okay, okay. All right, then. Well, members, any additional questions? Madam Chair, I'll move to amend and do pass. All right. Do I have a second? Okay, I'll second amend and do pass. Uh, the Matt, Secretary, can you do a roll call? Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? Yes. Chair Spearman? Yes. Okay, Let the so, record show that the motion does carry, uh, and we'll give the floor statement to um, Senator Harris. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Keene, I was doing my trying to fix the IT issues. Did you have uh, something else to add to this? If so, please do that before we close out. Thank you, Chair Spearman. For the record, Will Keene, Committee Council. Um, it was just about the uh, the initial issue that Mr. Mills brought up about section one, subsection four. Um, just to be clear, based on what Mr. Mills said, I was thinking we would look at the language in subsection four and simply add to the end of it um, that, the, you know, that the doctor can meet the requirements of subsection two other than any requirement to have medical records or to base a rating upon medical records. Um, that's what I thought. That's how I interpreted what uh, Mr. Mills said. Um, hopefully, um, he's still there and can just confirm that for me. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. So our motion uh, carries, and I will sign a floor statement to Senator Harris. Mr. Mr. Spearman, Mr. Mills yes. is on the line still. Oh, Mr. Mills, yes. Yes, Chair Spear, and to address uh, Mr. Keene's um, issue, Jason Mills, Nevada Justice. Yes, that's precisely what the intent was, uh, Mr. King. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Magarejo, we will go now to work session Senate Bill 290. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Cesar Magarejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, Senate Bill 290 enacts provisions relating to prescription drugs for the treatment of, of cancer, and it was sponsored by Senator Lang and heard on April 1, 2021. Uh, there is a mock-up attached to this uh, amendment. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there is a mock-up attached to this work session document, and the proposed amendments include to add a new subsection to sections one, three, four, six, seven, eight, and 11, to provide that if a health insurance policy uses a formulary, certain insurers are not required to allow an insured to apply for an exception from a step therapy protocol for a drug that is not included in the formulary. Uh, next amendment is to amend subsection one of sections one, three, four, six, seven, eight, and 11, to provide that certain insurers are required to allow an insured or the attending practitioner of the insured who has been diagnosed with stage three or four cancer to apply for an exemption from the step therapy protocol, except as otherwise provided in the newly proposed subsection. Amendment number three is to amend subsection 1C of sections one, three, four, six, seven, eight, and 11 to remove the requirement that each applica application be reviewed by a physician who specializes in oncology. Instead, provide that at least one physician a registered nurse or a pharmacist is required to review each application. The Fourth Amendment is to amend subsections 3A of sections 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 11 to clarify that certain insurers must make a determination of a complete application for an exemption of the STEP protocol or may, be re or may request additional information necessary to complete the application not later than 72 hours after receiving the application. The next amendment is to amend subsection four of sections one, three, four, six, seven, eight, and 11 to delete the re uh, requirement that certain health insurers must respond to a step therapy exemption within 24 hours if the attending practitioner determines that a step therapy process may seriously jeopardize the life or health of the insured. Amendment number six to amend subsection seven of sections one, three, four, six, 
a 7, 8, and 11 to authorize the insurer to conduct a review, uh, a, conduct a review not more frequently than one once each quarter and in accordance with available medical evidence to determine whether the drug remains necessary to treat the insured for the cancer or symptom. In addition, I require the insurer to provide a report of the review to the insured. Remember number seven is uh, amend subsection eight of sections one, three, four, six, seven, eight, and 11 to provide that an insurer is required to post in an easily accessible location on an internet website maintained by the insured a form requesting an exemption from the step therapy protocol. In addition, deletes language regarding posting on an internet website, the procedures to apply for an exemption and the contact information of a person that an applicant, applicant may contact for assistance. Uh, the Eighth Amendment is to amend Section 9 to remove the requirement that a health maintenance organization that provides health care services to recipients of Medicaid under the state plan for Medicaid grant an exemption of its step therapy protocol upon receipt of an application. Instead, the amendment provides that such health maintenance organizations are exempt from such requirements. Uh, next amendment is to add a new section to the bill to amend the veteran revised statutes 695G.090 to provide that a managed care organization that provides health care services to recipients of Medicaid or insurance pursuant to Children's Health Insurance Program are exempt from provisions of the bill requiring certain managed care organizations to grant an exemption of a step therapy protocol. And the final amendment is to delete sections 14, 15, and 16, which require the Department of Health and Human Services to grant an exemption of its step therapy protocol upon receipt of an application from a recipient of Medicaid or attending practitioner of the recipient who has been diagnosed with stage three or four cancer. Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Hey, Mr. Megarejo, uh, committee, any questions or comments? Yes. Let's see here. Any anyone anyone have a question? Yes, yeah, Madam Chair. I see Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one question uh, throughout the sections, and I think it was the last one mentioned, where we are uh, uh, allowing a health insurance company that uh, uses uh, formulary. Uh, uh, they are exempt from this requirement. Um, I'm I'm. I, I'm curious as to why we would do that since nearly every policy, every insurer uses a PBM and a formulary. Uh, this seems to uh, be an exception that swallows the rule for the most part. Um, um, was, was that the intent? Uh, was this pushback from the PBMs or, or why are we exempting uh, the majority of people that are covered in Nevada? I don't know. I think uh, Senator Lang is on, but I think, uh, Will, can you answer that for Senator Pickard, please? Uh, thank you, Chair Spearman. For the record, Will Keene. Uh, I'm sorry, could Senator Pickard uh, repeat the question, please? Certainly. Uh, uh, in looking at uh, uh, the new sub nine in each of the affected um, uh, sections, we are exempting um, health insurance policies that use a formulary. And it's my understanding from some prior bills of my own uh, working in this space that uh, uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, people in Nevada are subject to a formulary. And uh, thus this seems to exempt the bulk of people from this bill. So it feels like an exception that's swallowing the rule um, uh, in terms of practice in most most uh, uh, people's insurance. I'm wondering what the rationale is for exempting them out. Is there a legal reason to do it? Is there a, a, a practical reason or is this just uh, uh, you know the result of the PBMs and insurance companies pushing back and not wanting to uh, be subject to this? Uh, thank you, Senator Pickard. Uh, for the record, Will Keen, Committee Council. Uh, there's no legal reason why subsection nine needs to be in there. It, the, it would be perfectly fine not to have sec, subsection nine uh, in the provisions. Um, legally, it works to have it or to not have it. And you may be right that practically speaking, this is going to dramatically reduce the applicability of these sections. Um, but uh, as far as what actually what the actual cases are out there, I don't I don't know. 
Um, Madam Chair. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, Senator yeah. Lang. Hi, Senator yeah. Lang for the record. Um, so, Will, the reason that um, we put that language in there was because Clark County um, has a self-insured program and they already cover their employees and that's the language that their attorney suggested. Um, if you think there is a way that they could be exempt um, without having this language or this language is too broad and it includes people outside of Clark County um, or there's a simpler way to say it, uh, I am more than happy to do that. But that was the reasoning behind it. Right, I appreciate that. I uh, I guess if they're already doing it, they don't need to be exempted. Um, uh, that doesn't make sense in my mind. Uh, that they, uh, I mean, they didn't obviously talk to me. But um, uh, if they're doing it, we don't need to exempt them. If they're not doing it and they don't want to do it, that's a separate question. Um, but I certainly think that if they're doing it, uh, um, I just I don't mean to upset the apple cart here. I just uh, in my experience dealing with PBMs over the last four years and in, in, in a couple of bills, um, uh, they can exert a fair amount of pressure on the county. And uh, um, if they're already doing it, I don't get it. Anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. So may I ask a question of Will? So Will, do you think that we could take out that language then and they would still be exempt because they're already doing it? Uh, thank you, Senator Lang. For the record, Will Keene, Community Council. Um, it, it's not the fact that they are already providing the service that would make mm -hmm. them exempt. Um, what makes Clark County, mm -hmm. by Clark County, I assume you mean the, the Clark County government, the yeah. government of Clark County. Um, what makes the county workers uh, have, to, or what makes the county have to comply with this bill for the purposes of their employees is section 12. Section 12 is, is the standard way that we make uh, mandated benefits applicable to local government employees. And um, all we need to do is remove section 12 and then perhaps modify section 13, which is the, the provision which makes this requirement applicable to PEB for the state employees, but, but of course, uh, some local government entities, and I'm not familiar with all of the uh, local government entities in Clark County, but some uh, local entities uh, run their insurance through the PEBS program. Um, so I think all we need to do to eliminate Clark County is to uh, remove section 12 and uh, make sure that we appropriately limit section 13. And then, then Clark County would not have to comply with any of this and you would not need to have the sub nine uh, in the bill to, to exclude them. Okay, then Madam Chair. Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, what would be your recommendation on how to proceed if we were to do as Will suggested? I'm sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, I, I think I think it's I think it's your call. Um, we can always leave it there and um, do a floor amendment, uh, but it's going to be real tight if we have to come back and hear it uh, do a work session again. Okay, so um, will would it be okay if I work with you and then we'll just do a floor amendment so we can get it out of committee? Thank you, Senator Lang. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm happy to work with you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think we're now uh, entertaining a motion as to where we are. Madam Chair? Yes, please. Actually, I had a question. Could Mr. King just follow up again? If the county's already doing it, why would they have to be exempted? It shouldn't affect them if they're already doing it. So that's where I, I was curious in that line of questioning and reasoning. Madam Chair, if I may answer. Um, um, well, I, it's, it's really a policy decision. Um, the legislature, this would not be the first um, mandated benefit which, apply, which would be applied to the um, various private insurers, but not 
to uh, local government employees or state government employees. Um, I guess the, the question for the committee is, do you want to have this apply to Clark County and effectively have it not be meaningful for them because they already do it? Or do you want to just accept them out of the bill? Um, it's, it's, it's a policy decision. There's nothing legally wrong with taking them out, or taking the locals out. There's nothing legally wrong with leaving them in. Um, and there's nothing wrong with taking out subsection nine or leaving it in. Thank you. Senator Sotomayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm good with it as is. I'll, I'll follow whatever you want to do. Let's get this out of there, in my opinion, to help Ms. Lang out and let her I work on those issues as it progresses. So in that respect, I'll go whichever way the committee and or more importantly, the sponsor wishes to go. Chair Spearman. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Senator Scheibel, for the record, at this point, I would move to amend with the amendment language proposed by Senator Lang, which is contained within the work session document and do pass. Thank you. So we have a motion from Senator Scheibel. Do I have a second? Second. Second? Is that Vice Chair Neal? Yes, ma'am. So we have a second from Vice Chair Neal. Additional discussion? Now, and let me, let me just say to, uh, to the committee for Right now, there are very few mock-ups that are coming out of legal. So, you know, a conceptual amendment is um, where we would be. And if we have the language from the sponsor that um, replicates what the conceptual would be, then I think we understand where we're going. And if there are any questions, we can always ask those uh, before we vote on it on, on the floor. Okay. So, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Sec Senator Hardy. Yeah, yes. Senator Lang. Yes. Senator Neal. Yes. Senator Pickard. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Senator Settlemeyer. Yes. Chair Spearman. Yes. Uh, Senator, will you take the floor statement on this one? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we will close our work session and we will begin our hearings and I will turn over the metaphorical gavel to our vice chair. We will begin with Senate Joint Resolution 11. It urges Congress to ratify the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. All righty. Madam Chair, you may proceed. Chair Spearman, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I needed I needed to move some things around. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a screen, so uh, I, I am here. Teacher, I'm here, I'm here. So um, good morning, uh, Vice Chair Neal and members of Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. Uh, I am Pat Spearman. I represent Senate District 1 in North Las Vegas, and I'm here this morning to urge you to support Senate Joint Resolution 11, which urges the United States Congress to ratify the convention on the elimination of all forms of dis discrimination against women. Some of you may be asking, what is the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women it is commonly referred to as CEDAW. For those of you who do not know, and it's okay if you don't, this is an international human rights treaty that promotes gender equity, CEDAW for short. It was adopted by the United Nations in 1981. And I, I pause between that because I think it's important for us to understand how long this fight has been going on. Uh, 1979 is more than 40 years ago. As noted in SJR 11 and by UN Women, the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women, 
CEDAW requires the elimination of discrimination against women in all forms, including in the areas of economic development, health, safety, and education. Within its first 10 years, CEDAW was ratified by nearly 100 countries, and today, 189 countries have ratified CEDAW. Six countries, including Iran, Sudan, and Somalia, have taken no action to ratify or sign CEDAW, and two countries, Pali, a small island, a small island uh, nation in the Western Pacific, and the United States have only signed, have not only signed the convention. So, this question, this begs the question: How is it that over 97 percent of the countries in the world have ratified CEDAW, and the United States has not? After all, the tenets of CEDAW are based on the very issues for which we have been fighting for decades in this country. According to Thought, the Thought Company, the United States was one of the first signatories of CEDAW when it was adopted by the United Nations in 1979. A year later, President Jimmy Carter signed the treaty and sent it to the Senate for ratification. Unfortunately, Carter, in his final year of presidency, did not have the political leverage to get senators to act on the measure. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which is charged with ratifying treaties and international agreements, has debated CEDAW five times since 1980. In 1994, for instance, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee held hearings on CEDAW and recommended it be ratified, but efforts to block its ratification proved successful. Almost reminds me of the ERA. Anyway, I digress. Similar debates in 2002 and 2010 also failed to advance the treaty. Members of the committee, you have heard this for years, but I will say it again. And it is spelled out in explicitly in SJR 11. We have a persistent and egregious wage gap in this country, indeed, all over the world. Overall, women are paid 82 cents for every dollar paid to men which amounts to an annual gender wage gap of $10,157. It's even worse for African Americans who, African American women who typically earn 63 cents, Native American women who are paid 60 cents, and Latino women who earn just 55 cents to every dollar paid to white non-Hispanic men. This amounts to thousands of dollars per year in income compared to men, and it usually shows up in retirement, and that's why more women retire in poverty than men. These facts and figures represent the consequences of sexism and the consistent devaluing of women, and particularly women who are Black, Indigenous, and other persons of color, or BIPOC. We know for a fact that the gender wage gap persists regardless of industry, occupation, and educational level. And there are numerous causes, including discrimination and bias. That includes implicit bias. Article 3 of CEDAW addresses gender equity, gender equality, directly by employing ratified parties to take all appropriate measures, including legislation to ensure the full development and the advancement of women for the purpose of guaranteeing them, ex guaranteeing them enjoyment of their few, few full human rights. I can't talk this morning. Their full human rights and fundamental freedoms on the basis of equality with men. Senate Joint Resolution 11 addresses other critical concerns, including violence against women, gross inequities in healthcare services and outcomes, and notable challenges when it comes to educational pursuits. Even during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen firsthand that women, gender minorities, the BIPOC community, and other marginalized groups have borne the brunt of the pandemic's worst impacts. Since the start of the pandemic, women have lost more jobs than men, which is eliminating recent gains made by women in the workplace. Moreover, according to the UN policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on women, and I quote, across every sphere, from health to the economy, security to social protection, the impacts of COVID-19 are exacerbated for women and girls simply by virtue of their sex 
or gender. The brief notes that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted women economically, worsened health care outcomes, and led to increased gender-based violence. Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee, as I've said before, we all must persist for equality. We must persist in improving human dignity, human rights, and we must persist against systemic racism and sexism and racial and sexual sexism discrimination that has perpetuated generational poverty, education and economic hardships, health adversities and in environmental deterioration. These problems go beyond the borders of our country and nearly all countries have ratified CEDAW in their efforts to address these ongoing concerns. Frankly, I'm baffled and a bit stunned that our country, the United States, has not taken the very simple step to ratify CEDAW. For these reasons and others that are highlighted in SJR 11, I urge you to support the approval of this resolution, resolution and let's take the fight to the United States Congress. And let me read, uh, Madam Vice Chair, what the resolution says. Whereas the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women an international human rights treaty promoting gender equality, gender equity, was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1979 and formally instituted in 1981. And whereas the convention requires eliminating discrimination against women in all forms, including in the area of economic development, whereas the national median annual pay for women who hold a full-time year-round job is 47000 299, while the median annual income for a man who holds a full-time year-round job, the same job, is paid $57,456, which means that women in the United States are paid 82 cents for every dollar, amounting to an annual gender gap of $10,000 plus. Dollars. I won't read all of these, but I'll read the, the salient points. Whereas violence against women is a manifestation of historically unequal power relations between men and women. And they have led to domination over and discrimination against women by preventing the full advancement of women. And whereas some groups of women, such as women belonging to minority groups, indigenous women, refugee women, migrant women, women living in rural or remote communities, destitute women, women in institutions or in detention, female children, women with disability, elderly women, and women in situations of armed conflict are especially vulnerable to violence. Whereas violence against women in the family and in society is pervasive and cuts across all lines of income, class, and culture, and must be matched by urgent and effective steps to eliminate its occurrence. And now, be it resolved by the Senate and the Assembly of the State of Nevada jointly that the members of the 81st session of the Nevada legislature hereby urge Congress to ratify the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women and be it further resolved that the secretary of the Senate prepare and transmit a copy of this resolution to the vice president of the United States as the presiding officer of the Senate, the speaker of the House of Representatives and each member of the Nevada congressional delegation and be it further resolved, the resolution becomes effective upon passage. Madam Vice Chair and those on the committee and those who are listening to us um, online, I think that it is so appropriate for the state of Nevada, who is the first state to have a female majority legislature, and we did it again this year just to prove that it wasn't a fluke. So two years, two, two sessions running, we've had a majority female legislature. This is a very important resolution and I would urge your passage. I have on the phone um, with me to help present um, Ms. Sandra Cosgrove and Ms. Jerry Burton. And I'll take Ms. Cosgrove first, if that's okay with you, Vice Chair. Ms. Cosgrove. Thank you. Uh, good morning, committee. So my name is Dr. Sandra Cosgrove. It's S-O-N-D-R-A-C-O-S-G-R-O-V-E. And I'm a history professor at the College of Southern Nevada and the executive director of Vote Nevada. I'm here this morning to speak in favor of SGR 11. 
I'm asking for an affirmative vote on SGR 11 because I regularly apply for workforce development grants that can help women access good paying jobs. And these grants often ask how my proposal aligns with federal, state, or local laws and policies. Having as many points of reference that clearly show government intent to assist women in becoming financially independent will help people like me help more women in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Jerry Burton. Hi, it's Jerry, can you hear me? Uh, thank you to the Committee on Commerce and Labor and thank you, Senator Spearman, for this resolution. For the record, my name is Jerry Burton. It's J-E-R-I-B-U-R-T-O-N. I'm the president of the Nevada chapter of the National Organization for Women. The National Organization for Women has been working on achieving equal rights for women for over 50 years, and we urge you to join us in our support of SJR 11 and ratifying CEDAW, as we've always supported the Equal Rights Amendment as well with Senator Spearman. We support SJR 11 and urge Congress to ratify CEDAW. It affirms principles of fundamental human rights and equality for all women. This would send a message to the rest of the world that the United States stands behind its commitment to provide equal opportunity for all. With the global pandemic crisis, the time is now to ratify CEDAW to help women and girls. And we urge your support. And thank you, Senator Spearman. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Just a few comments before we go to questions. Um, change, not only this country, but in the world is rapid. And the way the world looked 10 years ago, even five years ago, is not consistent with the reality of today. I also know that change for some people is very difficult to accept, but change has already happened. What SJR 11 simply says is for our country the one who says, we believe that everyone is created equal and endowed by powers from the almighty. We say that, we say we're, we're, we're uh, a democracy. We say that we are, we are promoting uh, equality for women. We say all of those things. What this resolution will do, if we are to ratify it, this will put feet on our words and help us to walk our talk. I urge a passage. Okay, thank you for that. Members, any questions? So I, it's, Chair Spearman, I have one question. Um, so we passed the resolution and then what what are the real life steps that are supposed to take place? Because it's, it's really broad. I've seen a lot of the legislation that's come through the building this session. Um, what what actions are are you expecting to occur within the state? Because this crosses public private. So th these are the actions that I would anticipate would happen uh, once um, it is passed in both houses, the Secretary of the Senate to transmit it to our federal delegation, to our Vice President of the Senate and members of our congressional delegation. This is something that personifies, if you will, our commitment to equality and to lifting women out of the pervasive poverty and degradation that we have endured for years. It is my hope that once this has been transmitted to the Vice President, Vice President Kamala Harris, and I think that it's noteworthy that this is the first time in our history that we have had a woman of African and East Asian descent to fill the role of Vice President. Astounding. And that's, that's just another example of the change that has taken place. So it would be my expectation that our fellow federal delegation would join us, would join us in encouraging the entire Congress to pass or to ratify SJR 11 and to ratify, to sign on as a signatory for CEDAW. That would be my expectation. And again, uh, for people in this state, it's another step that Nevada takes to show that we lead 
on equality and equity. Okay, thank you for that. So seeing no questions, we will go to uh, whoever is in line for support. Thank you, Vice Chair. To testify in support of SJR 11, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 005, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 005, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Moving to the next caller. If you've recently just joined us and you would like to testify in support of SJR 11, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, I'm going to try this caller one more time. Caller with the last three digits of 005, please press star six now. There we go. Thank you so much. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Rebecca Gibson. That's R-E-B-E-C-C-A-G-I-P-S-O-N. Mem Madam Chair and members of the committee, I'm Rebecca Gibson, Chief of Staff for the City of North Las Vegas. The City of North Las Vegas would like to thank Senator Spearman and offer support for SJR 11 that urges Congress to ratify the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Discrimination against women comes in various forms, from inequities realized through gender wage gaps and lack of representation in educational materials, particularly for women of color, to violence against women and impacts in the workforce due to the pandemic. On a personal note, I've watched phenomenal women such as Senator Spearman and countless other trailblazers and learned through their hard work and determination that anything is possible for a woman that dares to dream. A woman like me that speaks before you today as Chief of Staff for the great city of North Las Vegas. Susan B. Anthony wrote, we ask justice, we ask equality. We ask that all the civil and political rights that belong to citizens of the United States be guaranteed to us and our daughters forever. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me this time. Thank you for that. BPS, I, I forgot to mention we're going to do uh, two minutes um, instead of three minutes per caller. Thank you, Vice Chair. If you've recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SJR 11. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, you have no more callers left in support at this time. Okay, so we will move to opposition. To testify in opposition of SJR 11, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 859. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning. This is Janine Hansen, State President of Nevada Families for Freedom. We oppose SJR 11, which endorses the United Nations CEDAW Convention. CEDAW was originally passed by the United Nations in 1979. It has never been ratified by the United States for many good reasons. The language in SJR 11 is very deceptive and most, mostly refers to wages for women, but CEDAW covers many other issues. On the United Nations website regarding CEDAW, it states, the convention is the only human rights treaty which affirms the reproductive rights of women. CEDAW's committee in charge of compliance has interpreted Article 12 to mean approval of abortion and has pressured 44 nations to legalize or increase access to abortion. Any endorsement of CEDAW is an endorsement of abortion. Article 16 also orders a massive interference with U.S. laws 
as well as with our federal state balance of powers by obligating the federal government to take over all family law, including marriage, divorce, child custody, and marital property. When Edmund S. Muskie was Secretary of State under Democrat Jimmy Carter, he issued a memo stating that the treaty completely fails to take into account the division of authority between the state and federal governments in the United States. His memo also admitted that this treaty applies to private organizations and areas of personal conduct not covered by U.S. law. CEDAW sets us on a dangerous road allowing unelected bureaucrats in the United Nations to interfere with the governance of the United States as well as the state of Nevada. CEDAW degrades the chosen role of many women as mothers. For instance, when their committee criticized Ireland for promoting a stereotypical view of the role of women as in the home and mothers, Belarus for such symbols as Mother's Day, and Slovenia because less than 30% of children under three of, uh, years of age were in formal daycare. Nevada Families endorses mother care of children as the best kind of care for children, not institutionalized care. Oppose SJR 11, which urges ratification of CEDAW, which is an endorsement of abortion, the interference in U.S. and Nevada oh, law by interrupt. U.N. bureaucrats, and designates the role of mothers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Next. caller. Caller with the last three digits of 319. Please lovely spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. This is Melissa Clement, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-C-L-E-M-E-N-T, representing Nevada Right to Life. Nevada Right to Life, as the statewide affiliate of, the, of National Right to Life Committee, opposes SJR 11. While the CEDAW Committee has admirable goals, like eliminating sex trafficking, Article 12 of the document has been used to intimidate nations to change or eliminate their abortion laws. I've submitted a document with support for this statement. For the sovereignty of our nation, our state, and respect for other nations, we urge a strong no. I would now like to provide my personal position on this resolution. I am a Nevadan and a woman, and I agree with many of the whereases in this resolution. My question, why are you wasting valuable time in commerce and labor to vote on this worthless piece of legislation? Instead of writing 12 wage gap whereases, move valuable legislation that will save women's jobs and women-owned businesses. Fulfill your legislative role, end the emergency orders, open the economy, put our kids back in school playing sports, provide a safe environment by allowing women to protect themselves and police officers to do their job. The past year has done more to damage the status of women than anything else, yet you continue to ignore it. Vote no on this ridiculous resolution, let it die, and get back to work. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 199. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair. I was attempting to get into support, but I seems I didn't get in line in time. Can I proceed with testimony in support of this measure? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Caller, please continue. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tess Opferman. That is spelled O P F E R. M-A-N, speaking on behalf of the Nevada Women's Lobby. SJR 11 is, um, is an important measure because day in and day out at the Nevada legislature, we hear bills about sexual assault, domestic violence, human trafficking, hate crimes, pay inequality. Our legislators, you, are working hard to pass policies to help address these inequalities. Inequalities for women of color, inequalities for white women, inequality for women addressing their gender identity and sexual orientation, inequality for women in the workplace. But we must not be complacent. It is time we pass a declarative measure to urge Congress to co ratify the, con the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Please take this measure by supporting SJR 11 and supporting women in our state. Thank you to Senator Spearman for your ongoing support and passion and for your strong leadership. The Women's Lobby asks you for your support on this measure and we thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, caller. We are currently in opposition of SJR 11. 
To testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 373, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Yes, uh, my name is Bob Russo, and I strongly oppose SGR 11. As an American who values the sovereignty, sovereignty of our nation, I believe that urging Congress to ratify the 1979 United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women would set a new president in our nation to allow unelected global bureaucrats to decide what we can do or not do in our own backyard, meaning our nation. Again, this is a dangerous step toward American losing its sovereignty. Another major concern I have is the connection of this UN convention to abortion. I believe that enforcing this convention in the United States would cost many lives to the innocent unborn. It could place an international law or obligation on the federal and state governments and override lawful limits on abortion in various states. And it could force citizens to fund abortion against their will or conscience. Passing STR 11 could jeopardize the rights of parents to be involved in the decision of their daughters regarding abortion. And in my opinion, based on experience from the women that I've known in the past who have had abortions, young women, when I'm talking about under 18, who don't have a lot of experience in life, are not mature enough to understand the ramifications or long-term trauma that they may encounter from getting an abortion. I know many young women that did it, and regret it. Lastly, it's unfortunate to me that the feminist movement that the UN Convention advocates places minimal value on the unique and golden qualities of the feminine energy, such as motherhood and the nurturing of the family. Women have their unique characteristics and strengths, and the same can be said of men. Unfortunately, it appears to me that neither are valued in today's world, and that's sad. Therefore, I do not favor the ratification of the UN Convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women because it certainly discriminates against the unique qualities that femininity brings into our world. So please oppose SGR 11. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, caller. If you've recently just joined us, we are currently in support on SJR 11. I'm sorry, we are currently in opposition. Opposition of SJR 11. To testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you recently just joined us, we are in opposition of SJR 11. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, you have no more callers in opposition at this time. Okay, so we will go to neutral. To testify neutral on SJR 11, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify neutral on SJR 11, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, you have no callers neutral at this time. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Madam Chair, any closing comments? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I certainly appreciate everyone who called in, those who were in support and uh, those who were in opposition uh, for exercising their uh, right uh, for free speech. I just want to say a couple of things here. Um, I think someone alluded to uh, we're wasting our time with this. So let me be clear. I am black. I am a woman, I am a member of the LGBTQ community, and I did not grow up with privilege. And so anytime I'm fighting for equality and equity, it's well worth my time, well worth my time. It was worth my time when I spent almost three decades in the military, and it's worth my time right now. The other thing that I, I noticed, and, and it's um, <clears throat> there is a glaring inconsistency uh, because um, the government can can tell us about reproductive rights, but the government cannot tell us we have to wear a mask so that we can reopen our economy. Some people are not mature enough to understand what 
abortion is like, but they're mature enough to uh, carry a firearm. Some people advocate for the child in the womb, and I'm good with that. But I believe that taking that to the next level means that you oppose the death penalty. So if there is a right to life for someone in the womb, certainly there is a right to life for someone who has exited the womb. We always talk about we don't want some foreign government telling us what to do. Uh, but, you know, I would I would encourage people to look in your closet and see how many articles of clothing are made in Vietnam, made in China, <laughs> made in Germany, made in Europe. Look in your garage. What kind of car do you drive? Um, all of those things, if they were not made here, they were imported. And guess what? It was a matter of treaties. It was a matter of coming together and saying, this is what we will send to you, you us, and the U.S. saying, this is what we'll send to you, and this is what it will cost. You know, we start talking about, uh, we don't want these things to happen. Well, you know, the GDP is really dependent upon our interaction with the global world. So uh, I appreciate uh, the opinions that were um, in uh, opposition, but I will always fight, always fight for equality and equity. I don't care who it's for. I will always fight for that. And it is never, never a waste of my time. But you know what? 40 some years after it was first incepted, 1979, this is what I think. I'm like Fannie Lou Hamer because we've addressed several bills here this session that deal with equity and equality. Fannie Lou Hamer said on one occasion, she said, I'm tired of being sick and tired. I'm appalled that we're still having to fight these battles in the 21st century, but fight I will. I will persist. The late RBG said, we're not really act asking for special rights, and I'm paraphrasing here, we're not asking really for special rights. What we're asking people to do, men especially, is to take your foot off of our neck. The only thing that SJR 11 does is it promotes equality. And if the government can't tell us we have to wear a mask, then I am still struggling to understand the logic that the government can tell us about reproductive rights. That's all, Vice Chair. Thank you so much, and thank you, committee, for listening. So we will close the hearing on SJR 11, and we will open up the hearing on SB 386. Am I turning the gavel back over to you, Chair? You can, unless you become attached to it. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> <laughs> SJR 386, I'm sorry, uh, SB 386, and I believe this is uh, Majority Leader Canizaro's bill. And ma'am, please begin when you are ready. Yes, and uh, thank you, Chair Spearman, uh, Vice Chair Neal, and members of the committee. It is always a good day to be in commerce and labor with all of you. Um, for the record, my name is I currently serve as the senator from Senate District 6, which is in the northwest portion of the Las Vegas Valley. And I'm very pleased to be with, here, with you here this morning to present to you Senate Bill 386, which creates the Nevada Hospitality and Travel Workers Right to Return Act. As we are all aware, um, even in this digital format by which we are presenting these bills before the committee, Nevada has never confronted, nor the world confronted a crisis quite on the scale of COVID-19. Before I discuss the economic impacts of the pandemic on our state's economy and our workforce, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the thousands of Nevadans who have lost their lives to COVID-19. These are thousands of Nevadans who have lost family members, who have lost loved ones, and who have lost friends and hundreds of thousands who have fallen sick with this virus and those who are still feeling the effects of the COVID-19 virus. It is the understatement perhaps of the year to say that this pandemic sent shockwaves throughout all facets of our society. This past year has been extremely devastating for Nevada's families, students, businesses, and for our workers. The hospitality industry, which is the lifeblood of Nevada, has been hit particularly hard. And many families who rely on every paycheck, every single one for necessities, have had an incredibly challenging time. 
The costs of COVID-19 are evident in the devastating effects on physical and well mental well-being of Nevadans. The lost jobs, the compromised schooling, the shuttered restaurants. Last March, during the early outbreak of the virus, Governor Sisolak took bold and necessary action in shutting down the state and closing non-essential businesses. We knew, as he did, that saving lives would require economic sacrifices, but Nevadans pulled together in order to slow the spread of the virus. And I can't say enough how grateful I am to the governor for having taken those actions because it did save lives. It saved Nevadans. It saved families. However, as a result of these emergency precautions, we of course experienced the inevitable and a severe crash in employment in the spring of 2020. The disproportionate burden was borne by workers in the gaming and hospitality industries workers of color and workers unable to do their jobs remotely, those who could not adapt. The pandemic has continued to rage on for more than a year now. From March 2020 to March 2021, there have been more than 878,000 new claims for unemployment benefits between March of 2020 and March of 2021. The pandemic forced casino and hospitality workers to be discharged, furloughed, and for those workers to be laid off on massive scale. These are job sectors that are central to Nevada's economy and to the well being of this state as a whole. Growing up, I was the very proud daughter of a waitress and a bartender, both of whom were members of Culinary Local 226. Because I grew up in a family who relied on exactly the type of jobs that have been so hard hit by this pandemic, I can only imagine what these workers and their families have been through over the past year. I remember times where my family struggled and it was never easy. And my parents relied on every paycheck to put food on the table and to keep a roof over our heads. From that experience alone, I can tell you that I believe that these workers need, what they need most is the promise of a return to their previous jobs as the pandemic recedes and business returns. And let me be clear, these workers, that we're talking about these families that we are talking about, families just like mine, all they wanna do is go back to work. And I know that our, our businesses who support them want to open back up and have them there. I believe that there is hope ahead for our state and for our country. And every day more and more vaccines become available. Our economy continues to rebound and more and more people are interested in putting the past year behind us and coming back to Nevada like they once did. We are coming out on the other side of this, to be sure. We are coming out on the other side of this truly terrible time. But as we do so, we have to make sure that our workers who have shouldered so much of the fallout from this pandemic are not left behind. Unfortunately, job recovery has lagged, and I think it would be no secret to anyone on this committee or in our communities to know that, uh, that those in the Black, Indigenous, and people of co color community have had even slower employment recoveries than their white counterparts. If we want Nevada's economy to come back stronger than ever, it is critical that we make sure that our workers are a key piece of that comeback, that our workers are taken care of. And that is why I'm here to bring to you Senate Bill 386, which provides that it is in the public interest to ensure that the state's casino, hospitality, stadium, and travel-related employers honor their former employees' rights to return to their former positions. Doing so will speed the transition back to a functioning labor market and will lessen the damage to the state's economy. Recalling workers instead of searching for new employees would minimize the time necessary to match employees with jobs and reduce the unemployment rate more quickly. In addition, Senate Bill 386 provides these workers with the economic security of knowing that they will have an opportunity to return to their jobs when business returns. Madam Chair, here with me today to tell you firsthand what this will mean for our hospitality and casino workers is Mr. D. Taylor, the international president of Unite Here, which includes in its membership Culinary Local 226. Madam Chair, with your permission, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Taylor to give a brief synopsis of the impacts of how this bill would affect workers in Nevada um, before continuing to walk through the sections of the bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, Mr. Taylor, please proceed, and it's so glad to see you again. 
Um, well, first, thank you, uh, Chairperson. And I want to thank Senator Conazaro for sponsoring this bill. And I really want to thank the members of the committee for hearing us describe one of the many consequences of the pandemic, not just on our members, but workers in the hospitality industry, the need to support them now. Um, you know, I, I thought about this testimony before I started, and I have to say, no one has been a bigger advocate and booster for the gaming and hospitality industry when they provide good, well-paying jobs in our union, Unite Here, which here in Nevada is called the Culinary and Bartenders Union. In fact, we have vigorously advocated and helped lobby for expanded gaming here and in other states, Massachusetts, New York, Maryland, Mississippi, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and many, many more. Further, our union has defended the gaming and hospitality industry, whether it be under attack in Congress, other state capitals, or right here in Nevada. And at times that's been extremely difficult for us to defend the gaming industry, particularly on the tax rate, which is at 6.75, when in other states, the same employers, some in very red states are paying a lot more. In Mississippi, 12% tax rate. Louisiana, 21.5%. Indiana, 43.5%. New York, 45%. Illinois, 50%. Pennsylvania, 55% and in Maryland, 61%. And we've been on the hospitality side against critics in this state, even when it means sometimes going against who we consider our friends on the tax rate, because generally the gaming industry, the hospitality industry has provided decent, stable jobs that help us all. And the industry often has uplifted jobs and convention centers, hotels and airports, to be better than in most states because they've set a decent standard for our state. And as Speaker Conazario said, our world turned upside down last March. The pandemic has taken a lot from our workforce in the hospitality industry. They're more likely to get sick, higher number of deaths and family members dying. They put a workforce out on the street and they tried to decipher the unemployment system that was outdated. And these jobs don't have the luxury of working from home. Often these same workers were single parents and the sole breadwinners in their family. And in fact, some of you probably listening to this were single parents, are single parents working in the hospitality industry. They're proud, they're hardworking, they're not looking for handouts and they're dedicated to the jobs in their family. So we saw a mass unemployment. And for the first time, we saw a proliferation of food banks across the state. And even with the June reopening of the casinos, the visitor volume to this day is still considerably below pre-COVID days. Airports and hotels certainly fall into that same category. Convention type facilities are still dormant except to administer COVID tests and vaccines. Now, today will be a fascinating day of deeds versus words. You know, my mother always told me, don't tell me what they say, tell me what they do. Every company represented by the Nevada Resort Association or the American Hotel and Lodging Associations, they say often their most important asset are their employees. Those are their frequent words. Today, these companies are using their words saying this bill is too is wrong. It's too complicated. It's the wrong solution. It is not necessary. We could use some revision. It needs to be tweaked. Meanwhile, their deeds have resulted in loyal, dedicated employees being fired. Where actually employers have used the pandemic as cover for firing employees. And these are the same employers that asked us, are you? to go to Congress to ensure that the hospitality industry receives special funding to absorb the disastrous impact from COVID. Same employers asking for our help, which we did gladly. <clears throat> and first, let's talk about those who were fired. 
because of the pandemic. I can speak for our union, but I have representative of the hospitality industry in the state. 58% female, 45% Latinx, 18% white, 15% Asian, 12% black, 1% indigenous, and then we have a little unknown. As you can tell, predominantly women and people of color, the exact same communities most affected by COVID deaths. And without this legislation, will be permanently harmed along with the communities where they live. But jobs should not be a partisan issue. I can't think of anything that frankly is less partisan than a good job to support the American dream. Second, as Speaker Conazario said, this is good for the economy and businesses, Bill. This legislation provides for our already trained and experienced staff, a staff that was praised a year ago by the same companies to get back to work immediately. There's no retraining necessary. They're ready day one. No training cost or investment. Two, these are long-term workers dedicated to communities. These are not Johnny come lately's. They will pump money back into the local economies, which we need for small business. And three, statistically, displaced older workers typically see a 35% decline in wages if they have to start over. At some point today, you will hear all kinds of reasons not to support this bill. That does not get to the fundamental question. Why are workers who through no fault of their own due to the pandemic get tossed into the scrap heap as the casinos and hotels reopen and rebound? I'm going to give you two examples, facts. Two casino companies who've had mass firings using the pandemic as an excuse. Horseshoe and Four Queens. Just in our employees, culinary and bartenders, they have fired over a thousand years of experience of a workforce. Station casinos, their massive terminations alone, just for the type of workers we represent, 20,000 years of service gone. To put that in perspective, if we were to go 20,000 years back on the earth, we'd be in the ice age. So we'll hear, as you might, that many properties have openings they can't fill. They don't say that about bartenders. They don't say that about food servers. They don't say that about cocktails. They often say that about housekeepers. Now, why is that? Very simple. Child care facilities, school openings, and frankly, COVID-related issues. You'll hear an excuse, oh, well, we paid our workers during layoffs and furlough. That's great, and we applaud that. But we also applaud the U.S. Congress and the CARES Act bill that often help you provide those wages and benefits, and that's a good thing. So why are we firing these same workers as a result of the pandemic, who a year ago you praised as your most important asset? You know, finally, if you like me, you've watched a lot of March Madness, and there's a commercial which I think is applicable to this bill. It's not complicated, it really isn't. Right to return is good for the economy. It's good for the state. It's good for the workers who live here, your constituents, the people that voted for you. You have an opportunity to have the most profound effect on hardworking residents who clean the rooms, mix the drinks, set the stage lights, park the cars, in the hardest hit industry in the country. These are your neighbors. These are the people on your kid's soccer team. And when the soccer comes back, you want those kids to be able to afford their uniforms. And these are the people in your church or in your temple. That's who they are. Now we all need a measure of hope and salvation. There's a little light now, but we all need a little grace in this pandemic too for their years of service, for their dedication to this industry, for what we and they have been through. It's really hard 
to make the chapter of COVID a little bit better for these Nevadans. And this bill does that. So we hope you support this bill. Shouldn't be a partisan bill at all. When is having a hard working job trying to provide for you and your families, not relying on government assistance, a partisan bill? Should not be. And no one who's dedicated their lives and years to service these companies should be treated like an old pair of shoes and thrown out. I want to thank Speaker Conazaro for your compassion and your understanding of really how bottom up economics works and how that's made Nevada very special and very great. And we will be there again, but we will be there when the workers who have made this state great have an opportunity to go back. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, Majority Leader Canazaro, you have anyone else presenting? And I'm they finish, just tell them to keep going. So, and I, I don't have to come back and say, okay, just, just keep going. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I don't have additional speakers, but at this time, I would like to walk the committee through the sections of the bill and explain what each of those sections do. Um, thank you again, Dee, for being here and talking to us about the impact that this really does have on every every little piece of our community. Um, I want to begin by walking through just some of the sections of the bill, um, and we'll start with Section 4. Section 4 provides that the provisions of Sections 2 through 28 inclusive establish minimum labor standards and do not preempt or prevent employment standards that are more protective and beneficial for employees. Sections 6 through 19 define certain terms applicable to the provisions of the bill. Section 11 defines covered enterprise as an airport hospitality operation, an airport service provider, a casino, an event center, or a hotel that is in a county whose population is 100,000 or more. Section 16 defines a laid off employee as an employee who was employed by an employer for not less than six months during the 12 months immediately preceding March 12th of 2020, and whose most recent separation from the employer occurred after March 12th, 2020, which was due to a governmental order, lack of business, reduction in force, or another economic non-disciplinary reason. Section 20 requires an employer in the event of a layoff to provide an employee who is to be laid off a written notice of the layoff, which must include a notice of the layoff and the effective date of such layoff, and a summary of the right to reemployment pursuant to sections 2 through 28 inclusive of this act. The notice must be provided at the time of the layoff. However, if the layoff took place before the effective date of this act, the employer must provide such notice within 20 days after the effective date of this act. Section 21 requires employers to retain certain information of an employee, including the notice regarding the layoff, for at least two years after an employee is laid off. Section 21 further provides that the two years begins on the date of the written notice. Section 22 requires an employer to offer a laid off employee each job position, which becomes available after the effective date of this act and for which the laid off employee is qualified, which includes the same or similar position that the employee filled at the covered enterprise at the time of the layoff or a position that the employee can be qualified for with training that would be provided to a new employee. Section 22 requires employers to offer job positions in an order of preference, beginning with the same or similar position that the employee filled at the covered enterprise at the time of layoff. Next would be a position that the employee can be qualified for with training that would be provided to a new employee. And if more than one laid off employee is entitled to a particular position, preference goes to the laid off employee with the greatest length of service or the covered enterprise. The employer is also required to afford a laid off employee who is offered a position at least 10 days to accept or decline that offer. An employer who declines to recall a laid off employee because the employee lacks the qualification and hires another person must no later than 30 days after making the decision provide the laid off employee with a written notice of the decision identifying all the reasons for the decision. Section 23 prohibits an employer from terminating, reducing compensation, refusing to employ, or otherwise taking any adverse action against a person who takes certain actions in relation to the provisions of this act. 
Section 24 authorizes the enforcement of the provisions of this act in a civil action in any court of competent jurisdiction brought by one or more employees or the employees may designate an aging or representative to maintain an action for and on behalf of all employees. Section 24 sets forth certain standards for establishing and rebutting certain presumptions concerning violations of the provisions of this act and authorizes the imposition of an injunction against violations and the issuance of orders or other appropriate affirmative action and certain awards to a prevailing plaintiff. Section 25 imposes the requirements and duties of the provisions of sections two through 28 inclusive to certain employers who purchase or otherwise acquire another employer that owns or operates a covered enterprise and extends the rights afforded by sections two through 28 to a laid off employee of such employers. Section 26 provides that the provisions of sections two through 28 inclusive apply to all employees, regardless of whether the employees are represented by a collective bargaining agreement. Section 27 prohibits the provisions of sections two through 28 inclusive of this act from being construed to invalidate or limit certain other rights, remedies, or procedures available to an employee. And finally, section 28 provides for the severability of provisions of this act by a court under certain circumstances. Madam Chair, this does conclude my presentation of Senate Bill 386. I do want to note that I am aware and the committee is going to hear from uh, businesses and other entities who are going to oppose this bill. I would like to note that we are working with them and are in the midst of ongoing conversations to work out some of the issues and hope to find a pathway where we can protect our workers here in Nevada. Thank you again for allowing me to present this important measure this morning. I urge all of you to give so many of Nevada's working families the peace of mind that they will get their jobs back when this crisis is behind us. I urge you to support this important legislation to ensure that the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic does not leave behind workers who have been disadvantaged simply because of the job that they do. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, at this time, myself um, and Mr. Taylor are available for any questions that the committee members may have. And again, thank you for the time today. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Um, <clears throat> riveting presentation and um, jobs mean more than just a paycheck. It's um, food security. It's um, making sure you can pay your mortgage, making sure you have a place we have family to live. So thank you. Um, go now to questions from the committee and Vice Chair Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I had a question on um, section nine. Um, in section nine of the bill, the language also, it, well, it, it says a couple of things. So it picks up instrumentality uh, and estate trust and then foreign companies. So I'm trying to figure out who, who all are we bringing in under section nine? What companies are these? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, and through you, Madam Chair, to um, Vice Chair Neal, with respect to section nine, the reason why we wanted to make sure that definition was um, more expansive than simply saying a company is because some of these industries and some of these companies or maybe a different property might be owned under a different trust or a different legal entity. And we wanted to make sure that all workers were being treated fairly. Um, and so that's where you see some of that language about just the different ways in which a particular entity may be owned or operated. Um, and the intent is really to get at where we're talking about um, what types of employees are included here to really get at that at those employees, regardless of how the structure of that particular business entity operates. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Taylor, you had anything else to add on that section. Well, I appreciate that. I have uh, Paul Moore, who is our attorney, who has um, dealt with this language uh, in when it has passed in. Uh, numerous cities in the United States and is in front of the Minnesota legislature now, Connecticut legislature, and also California. Again, I'm not sure, Paul, uh, if you would like to introduce yourself and have any other comment on that. 
Yes, thank you, Dee, and, and thank you to the committee for um, letting me appear this morning. Uh, Paul Moore with McCracken, Stemmerman, and Holsbury, uh, and we represent the Culinary and Bartenders Union. And as Dee said, uh, we have been working in cities and states across the country uh, on similar measures um, in the many places across the country that are facing a similar economic fallout, particularly uh, particularly in their travel and tourism related industries. Um, and the language that's before you is very similar to laws that have passed in major cities like Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, Washington DC, San Diego, uh, and bills that are pending, um, as Dee said, in California, Connecticut, uh, Minnesota, Massachusetts. Um, to the question that was just posed uh, by Vice Chair Neal, um, this is a broad definition of a business entity and it's there for the reason um, uh, that Senator Panazaro has, has said uh, to make sure that we're capturing um, any form of employer um, you asked about domestic and foreign, and that refers to the fact that some corporations are incorporated in Nevada. Um, many others are incorporated in other states, um, and those are then considered under state law foreign corporations. So thank you for that. So, so in this provision, and I'm gonna tie this question to section 24, right? So in section 24, where uh, there's a private right of action and there's a class action language, um, and based on the uh, statement you just said, then that means we're engaging in long arm statute, right? Being able to reach outside of our borders, bring in a company that may be foreign. So talk to me about the application of uh, section 24 when we are engaging in this, in and what we're delineating in sections two through 28. And now we have a private, 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 private right of action from an employee or class action. And they are saying that there is a claim um, that they are asserting to the foreign company. What are um, we thank Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. So um, yes, there is in section 24, uh, 24 a private right of action, um, just like many of Nevada's other um, workplace laws, this could be enforced through a uh, civil action brought um, by a single employee or uh, brought on uh, a class action basis. Um, by doing business in Nevada, uh, a company submits to the jurisdiction of Nevada's courts um, for purposes of Nevada's labor standards. And so um, by describing the different forms of entities that act as employers in Nevada, um, the law does not need to raise a long arm statute. Um, we are talking about jurisdiction based on um, a contact with Nevada by doing business here and by employing uh, Nevadans. Uh, so the private right of action um, provision and uh, the uh, definition of an employer as including um, the broad different forms of business entities um, that are listed is quite typical for um, a state minimum labor standard. Okay, so I'm just wondering because I please, huh? Sorry, uh, state, your, state your name for the record, sir, please. I apologize, Paul Moore with McCracken, Stemmerman and Holsbury. So thank you for that. I, Cause I was just wondering, cause yeah, that is true, but there are also the subsets, right? When you get into it about principal place of business, um, you know, injury, the contract that may be in play that determines jurisdiction. And so, you know, I get the bill, I understand what the goals are, but I'm just trying to get into the policy, right? And try to understand the impact of the language and what it does. And so knowing that there are those sub factors that draw jurisdiction or choice 
uh, venue, et cetera. I'm just wondering, um, I, that, that's, that's why I was asking those questions. So I, I appreciate the uh, dialogue there. And I'll leave it there, Madam Chair. Hey, um, I see Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, uh, this is an interesting bill to me. Um, uh, I'm not an employment lawyer or a labor lawyer, uh, but in talking to those that are about this bill, um, uh, these are uh, the, the terms uh, are largely uh, similar to what we would see in a collective bargaining agreement. And in fact, I think that this is very similar to some language that's already in the culinary's uh, standard agreement. Um, and so uh, I, I'm a little surprised to see that we're trying to put CBA terms in statute because uh, uh, as uh, Senator Neal pointed out, the businesses in section nine uh, include uh, anyone who hires anyone. So we're talking about essentially every employer in the state of Nevada is now gonna be subject to CBA type requirements. I, I find that interesting. I'll be interested to see what uh, business has to say about that. But I'm, I wanna pick up specifically on what uh, uh, Senator Neal was getting at uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, private right of action, particularly when it comes to a rebuttable presumption. Um, we know that the, uh, the majority uh, of the layoffs, the vast majority, was due to the, uh, um, the uh, COVID-19 response and the shuttering of all of the, the uh, resorts. And so most of these people went out uh, uh, pretty much all on the same day. And uh, um, the response or the comeback, the, the reopening, uh, is certainly uh, uneven and uh, uh, it's slow. And so my concern is if an employer were to say, you know, they laid off a thousand people, they don't anticipate uh, the uh, uh, hotels filling up overnight as, or at least as quickly as they dropped off, that the employer is likely not to hire on every employee that they laid off uh, on the same day. And so now they're going to have to face a court to justify why they laid off a certain person um, uh, and then why they didn't hire them at least within the 30 day window uh, that they're afforded here. Um, uh, what is to prevent an employee, uh, maybe who wasn't as productive or, or didn't get along with his uh, or her a manager or coworkers who may not be as highly ranked in the uh, the rehire context, what's to prevent them from, uh, you know, filing a suit? And now we have a rebuttable presumption against the employer that they violated the law. How, how is this fair to the employer who can't simply fire up the, the engines and start back at the same speed as when they laid off? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if I I'll respond just briefly and then I think I can turn it over. Um, it sounds like we may have some additional information. Um, but thank you, Senator, for the question. And through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Picker, Nicole Canazaro from Senate District Six. Um, I think you bring up an interesting point that I, I felt um, warranted a response because it, the argument about whether this is language that may appear in certain collective bargaining agreements and why would we legislate that. Um, I think is is something that detracts from not only the purpose of the language in this bill, um, but also is something that we that has happened in any number of circumstances, right? We in this particular bill are trying to ensure that workers who really are the heart and soul of Nevada's economy are protected and given some assurance that they are going to also be able to go back to work and provide for their family. Um, in that, we are putting together language that says you have the right to re-employment and here is how that is delineated. Um, but why put this in statute? We have so many other things, um, different, different um, standards and requirements around healthcare provisions for which different collective bargaining agreements across all sectors of employment 
um, private and public bargain over health care requirements that we also legislate here um, in law. We have minimum wage requirements. Many, many of those topics fall also in certain collective bargaining agreements. We also have paid leave standards here in the state. Again, those are also things that can be part of collective bargaining agreements. You can see that there are OSHA and safety standards that we, that we also put into statute that can also be part of collective bargaining agreement. And so those are two, I think, separate conversations about whether a particular agreement that is a private party agreement is something that contains certain um, terms versus whether or not as a legislative body, we should be ensuring that workers have that right to return. And so I don't see the, that as an argument as to why we shouldn't be talking about the language in this bill. And I wanted to give a few examples of, of, of places where um, you know, just because a, an agreement somewhere out there in the universe contains a particular provision that somehow prevents um, the legislature from considering policy that is designed to help our constituents. Um, with respect to the response mechanisms, and certainly I think we all very distinctly remember um, the shuttering of the resort corridor and the strip in Las Vegas. It's something that um, I, I can't describe what that site looks like, especially for a kid like me that grew up here in Las Vegas. It is disheartening to say the least, um, but also necessary to keep people safe um, and to save lives. And so we know that the comeback doesn't happen automatically overnight. And that's why there are provisions built into this bill. And I'll I'll let Mr. Moore and Mr. Taylor talk maybe about more of those um, specific provisions if, if they would like to chime in. But that's why there are provisions in this bill that talk about the fact that if we're bringing employees back, which means those positions are ready to be filled, they're capable of being filled by the employer um, because they're meeting the demands of that business, that that employee who has... Um, who is qualified for that position, can be qualified for that position with minimal training, is considered to be brought back. Um, the arguments about whether somebody was a bad employee or didn't do their job or had an issue with management. But I think it's important to remember that this pertains to employees who are being laid off. These are people who were furloughed and laid off or are waiting to be called back to work because of the pandemic. These are not employees who had disciplinary actions and got fired for cause. These are not individuals who were not with a place of employment on the day in which their particular um, place of employment shut down. These are people who are working those jobs on that day. And but for the fact that that employer had to close their doors, that employee would have stayed in that job. So we're not talking about employees that are subject to disciplinary action and asking employers to bring back all of those individuals, um, but rather we're saying where you have an employee who was doing that job and doing that job in accordance with their employment duties on the day when that business closed, then there is a procedure for which they are called back to work as businesses start to open up, as demand for business grows, um, and as those employers are able to, to fill those needs. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Moore or Mr. Taylor, you have any additional um, pieces or, or more specifics about some of those provisions, but I, I thought that was worth it to know. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Canizaro and, and uh, through the chair um, to Senator Pickard. Um, I did want to, uh, this is Paul Moore, McCracken, Stemmerman and Holsbury. Um, I did want to um, just uh, respond to a couple of points. Um, the first has to do with coverage of this bill. Um, it would not uh, apply to every uh, employer in the state. Um, it applies to covered enterprises, um, which are those in uh, specified industries. Um, these are all travel related and hospitality related industries. Uh, so it applies to licensed gaming uh, facilities, it applies to resort hotels um, and to other hotels with more than 200 guest rooms. Uh, it applies to certain airport employers uh, and it applies to large event centers. Uh, so um, that point on the coverage. The um, rebuttable presumption uh, provision that um, 
that you're referring to is in a provision uh, prohibiting retaliation against employees for seeking to exercise their rights um, under this law. And um, as I'm sure uh, the, the committee is aware, most employment laws um, have uh, similar protections against uh, retaliation uh, in order to make sure that uh, that employees who have these rights um, are able to exercise them without fear that their uh, wages will be reduced or uh, their shifts will be changed or they'll be fired. Um, and the rebuttable presumption just applies to that um, uh, anti-retaliation provision. Uh, it is uh, near identical to an existing anti-retaliation provision um, in the NRS, which is 449.207. Um, that's a, a provision on uh, protecting uh, nurses in medical facilities that raise uh, claims and concerns about medical care being provided. So it has a similar type of rebuttable presumption. Um, and a presumption is just that under the law. It means that um, there is a prima facie case that's raised if within 60 days after someone, uh, an employee making a complaint uh, or a, an allegation of a violation, uh, then has their employment relationship have an, as, as an adverse employment uh, action taken against them. But that can be um, overridden by the employer by showing that there was a legitimate business reason uh, for the decision. Uh, so again, this bill is, uh, applies to large and major employers in the state. Um, uh, that rebuttable presumption uh, relates to the anti-retaliation provision. And thank you for that. I, I uh, was, uh, as I read uh, section nine, it seemed to cast a broader net. I appreciate the clarification that we're only talking about the major, although we don't have a, uh, um, a floor on the size of the employer. I assume we're talking about strictly resorts and hotels and, and those industries that are uh, large and relating to uh, tourism uh, or those that are served by this particular union. And I, I, that makes me feel better, although I would like to see some language that actually says that. Um, at the end of the day though, I, I guess I, I, uh, it's still coming back to uh, uh, and I recognize this is a, uh, a provision as to retaliation. Um, the uh, rebuttable presumption, of course, shifts the burden to the employer then uh, who has to demonstrate by clear and convincing evidence that uh, they did not actually uh, violate the section. Um, and section 25 is written pretty broadly. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, it, it gets back to my question of, you know, the inelastic nature of the recovery. Um, uh, it's not something that we can just decide, uh, how we're going to, uh, um, uh, bring people back in. It's more, uh, a, a long-term operation and we're not bringing back everyone at the same time. And my concern is, we this I, I don't see and maybe I, I just missed it. Maybe you can point me to the guidance to the employer that then has the ability to select who they are hiring. And and, you know, I didn't say that anyone was subject to discipline or that it raised to that level. But, you know, the practical reality is we all know that people uh, uh, differ in their ability to do their job, to get along with others, whatever it may be, that an employer may seek their uh, uh, their preferred uh, employees, for lack of a better term, that they will bring back first. And so does not this then authorize the person who did not come back to say, hey, you know, I made the request to come back Although there's some question right now, we, we've heard from many that um, uh, they're having a hard time bringing their people back. I know Stations, to use your point, has done a couple of job fairs, and they're saying they, they haven't had enough people coming back uh, to fill the openings that they have. But in any event, how did, what guidance are we giving to them that allows them to hire people back at a slower rate than they run themselves up for a claim that then will appear to be retaliatory if after the claim is made, they don't hire that person. 
what's to prevent that from happening? Uh, I, uh, I'll have Paul, but myself, I, I appreciate it, Senator. D. Taylor uh, from Unite Here International Union. Um, I mean, we're very aware that business is uneven. I mean, even today it's uneven. The weekends are much more crowded than during the week because of lack of business travel, which won't be coming back probably till 22. Uh, we get all that. I mean, this is, uh, uh, we don't live in a bubble and you can't ask uh, people back to work when there's no work to be had. So that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, you know, often when myself or somebody from the union speaks, we think we're just carrying the water of the union. This is not just about our union. It's not just a union or non-union issue. It's really people in the hospitality industry. And I really want to clarify that. There are thousands of people, just like on SB4, we'll never know or represent, same thing here, that have been the lifeblood of this economy. And we want them to have the opportunity to go back to work when there's business to go back to work. Uh, uh, we're, we're more cognizant than that than you can believe since you know, we see the folks in the food bank lines and still dealing with un unemployment on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want to clarify that with you, Senator, and I think that's a very fair and legitimate uh, issue and concern. Um, you know, clearly uh, on a more fundamental question is, will we be back to where we were in, let's say, 2019? I don't know, and I don't know when that will occur. Uh, and if somebody did know that, God bless. Uh, obviously, the sooner, the better, uh, but a lot of that depends on factors well outside. So we're not trying to impose uh, a full employment bill here. We're merely really looking for, Senator, and I think you can fully relate and understand this, that those long-term hardworking people who literally a year ago were praised as the backbone and the key to every company that's going to speak out against this, or associations going to speak out against this bill. Praised as the central. So I don't know what has happened to those same workers and the view of the companies. Like I said, I don't think uh, if we value uh, and we not just use words, but we use deeds, have their ability to go back to work when there is work. They can't go back when there is no work. We understand that all too well. So, Paul, if you'd like to add, you can answer the technical question. But I wanted to clarify that for the senator, and I appreciate your observations and comments, Senator. Thank you, Dee. Paul Moore, McCracken, Stemmerman, and Holsbury, um, uh, through the chair to Senator Pickard. Um, I, I did want to point to. Sir. Go direct. Thank you. I did want to point to several provisions. Um, first, in section 24. Um, uh, excuse me, in section 22, uh, 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 which is the main substantive provision, um, there is only a requirement for notice um, and a preferential hiring right for those who have worked in the same position when there is a job opening. So as Dee was saying, there's no obligation here uh, on the part of any employer to create a position that doesn't exist. Uh, this is simply um, uh, designed to say that if there is a position that's open, um, that notice of that position uh, be given to those who held the same or similar position prior to the pandemic. Um, and not just anyone prior to the pandemic, but those who worked for a minimum amount of time prior to the pandemic for the employer. Um, and uh, those who worked for the same employer prior to the pandemic, um, who could work this position with the same amount of training as, as anyone else off the street who would, might be hired for it. So there's no obligation to create any position here. There's no um, th there's no right to a job through this. There's simply a, uh, a mechanism here if there is a job that comes open um, to provide notice of that job to uh, those who have been laid off and um, to offer that position to those who have been laid off um, according to uh, the procedures that are set out. 
Um, the example, if there are instances, and I, I would expect, I'm not an expert in this area by any means, but I would expect that um, as vaccination proceeds, um, as um, we overcome uh, this virus, that uh, whatever bottlenecks there are in having people come back to their jobs, and, and I don't know that there are bottlenecks in those, are going to be much reduced. But nothing in this prohibits an employer from holding a job fair and from hiring those who didn't work for the employer before, so long as they've made that offer to uh, their own laid off employees who've already worked in the positions. And um, those uh, laid off employees uh, haven't wanted the job, haven't responded or haven't um, wanted to take the employer up on that offer. Um, the, the bill has a provision in it that's designed to make sure that this can be as expeditious a process as possible. Uh, employers can make simultaneous offers to groups of employees contingent on uh, a determination of um, whether someone who was a laid off employee for that employer uh, wants the job. Um, so there's nothing stopping an employer from doing that. Um, but there's no obligation to create a position that doesn't exist. I also want to point out that the definition of a laid off uh, employee um, is someone who um, was not laid off for a disciplinary reason. There's no obligation here on the part of an employer to bring back someone who was separated because they had performance issues um, or because of they had disciplinary issues. We're simply talking about those who were laid off through no fault of their own um, after the declaration of an emergency on March 12th uh, for economic reasons. Uh, and so I think that protects against some of the concern that you were raising about, um, about those who may have had disciplinary issues in the past. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And I'm not the one who raised that. That was uh, Senator Conizaro. Um, I, I didn't mean to talk about those that uh, were fired for cause or, or had disciplinary uh, actions. Uh, um, I, I was just, I guess I'm looking for guidance uh, since there's a rebuttable presumption that the employer's action was, was retaliatory uh, if they don't hire the person back um, uh, after a complaint, uh, or if that's the allegation uh, that they weren't properly hired back. Um, uh, I, I just, uh, we haven't, uh, you know, you haven't pointed to language that actually uh, allows the employer to uh, bring people on, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether that be through a global offer or notice rather that they're rehiring because it seems to me that they have to make an individualized offer. Uh, 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 otherwise, it's it doesn't meet the requirements. Um, but anyway, I we've taken too long on this. I appreciate it, uh, Madam Chair. If they want to uh, point to that, that'd be great. But uh, um, I I won't ask any more today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Scheibel. Thank you, Chair Spearman, and thank you so much, uh, Majority Leader Canizaro, for taking the time to join us in Commerce and Labor and presenting this bill. I think it is an incredibly important measure, and as I'm reading through the text, I think that there are a lot of um, really important pieces, and there are two in particular that I want to highlight and make sure that um, I, I'm understanding them and they and their purpose. And so, uh, first, I want to direct our attention to section 22. And um, the way that I'm reading this, it sounds like this provides some really necessary flexibility for employers um, in a couple of different ways. And um, am, am I correct that the, the idea here is that, you know, a team may have been made up previously of a certain number of people that had different roles within the team that were similar, but not the same. And we're not going to um, you know, say, okay, if you are a housekeeper for, you only come back as a housekeeper for, but that all housekeepers will be offered all housekeeping jobs that become 
available, even though they might be a housekeeper three and not a housekeeper, they might have been a housekeeper three and not a housekeeper four before they were laid off. Am I correct? Um, uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, that is correct, uh, that the, the term is um, the same or a similar position at the covered um, enterprise. So you are correct. Uh, Paul Moore, McCracken, Stemmerman, and Holsberry. And so would that also provide some flexibility for the ways that the work we do has changed since the pandemic? So, you know, if there, I am guessing that within the, you know, hotel industry, in the service industry, there are probably going to be more needs for sanitation and compliance and, um, you know, maybe even guest education, things like that, jobs that literally didn't exist before the pandemic. And so this would encourage or require those employers to invite back or recall the employees who previously worked at the same location, at the same employer to fill those positions if they're qualified for them. Um, thank you, Senator. Detailer from Unite here. That's exactly right. I mean, for example, I think based on COVID, the cleaning and health and safety protocols will be different. So let's say somebody used to just sweep the floor. Uh, they, they were a porter and now they're called a COVID cleaning specialist and they're doing uh, not, they're not sweeping, sweeping the floor anymore but they're responsible for all kinds of special cleaning techniques that I'm sure the companies, I know that some of the companies have done, that would be in the same category, that's similar. And, and as uh, Paul said earlier, and Senator Canizario said earlier, uh, they would get the same amount of training if they needed it, just like anybody off the street, but they'd have the first shot. Okay, and then that would also, it seems to me, that would um, prevent penalizing people who are maybe in higher positions that are no longer going to exist. Um, you know, if there are going to be fewer team leads and more quarters in the future, that would ensure that somebody who's a previous team lead or manager would be invited back as a quarter, as opposed to simply not being recalled. Well, we certainly hope so. That's the intent here. So, um, you know, generally, if you're in a lead position, let's just take what you're saying right now, detail from Unite here. Um, you had the most seniority, the most time. Uh, the, the frustrating thing about this legislation is that we have to have this legislation candidly. Um, and I'm extremely um, uh, amazed that the companies that have proclaimed employees as their biggest asset have discarded them like an old pair of shoes. So I hope the more senior shoes, let's say in the lead, get the opportunity that you just said. That's the intent. Um, and unfortunately, besides the frustration that we even have to have this legislation, I also don't believe in an honor system. And candidly, if we just rely on the companies to do the right thing, we wouldn't be here either today. So there has to be some way to enforce it. Um, and bluntly, uh, we have seen that just like you pass laws for a reason and you want to make sure the enforcement, this is also true here. And uh, I appreciate your questions. Thank you. And if I could have one more, Chair Spearman, um, I also noticed that the legislation, unless I'm missing it, doesn't say anything about um, an employee being required to accept that position that they're informed of, which makes sense to me because as we all recover from the pandemic, if I am that single mom who was previously working at a casino and you know I have a sick family member, I have somebody who's still in the hospital with COVID, I might not be able to go back to work tomorrow, but that doesn't mean that I have to give up my spot entirely. And if in two months, my previous employer does another round of rehiring and my loved one has recovered and I need to return to work I will still be included in that group of employees yeah. to be recalled. Um, I'm, it doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't require the employee to strategically decide um, if they can't accept an offer of employment at a certain time. Um, they're not going to. They're going to be able to still remain eligible. Is what I'm trying to ask. 
I, I would defer to either Senator Canizario or Paul on this. With your permission, uh, Senator Canizaro, um, I, Paul Moore, McCracken, Stemmen, and Holsbury. Um, Senator, yes, um, the idea here is that there will be some people um, who are in different um, life circumstances, maybe many people, um, and um, they will um, get a notice. Um, we have designed this so it's not an open offer. There's a 10 day period in which the laid off employee has to respond to the offer. But there may be people whose life circumstances, maybe they've moved, maybe they have a different job, maybe they um, have a childcare situation that they can't resolve in 10 days. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, those individuals may not be able to respond within 10 days to an offer. Um, they would then, if there were, as you say, another round of job openings, um, uh, receive the same notice and perhaps at that point and with more information that, hey, things are coming back, uh, they'll be able to respond to the offer and then they'll um, have a preferential right to rehire um, according to the uh, their seniority with the employer. Um, I did also want to point out uh, that the, the provision, and this is both in response to your question and to um, uh, Senator Pickard's question, um, well, the, uh, the bill includes language saying that an employer may extend simultaneous conditional offers of employment uh, to laid off employees. And this is in uh, section 22.4 um, with that final um, uh, offer of employment uh, contingent on uh, whether there's any response from those who are laid off employees and um, the order of seniority. So the idea here was uh, was not that there would have to be individual one by one offers of employment, but that instead um, employers that are covered by this bill could do what they do now, which is to um, have tranches of um, rehires and to offer employment to people for those. They could do the same thing here. Thank you. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I just want to underscore the value of this legislation. And I think that it really speaks to the realities on the ground of uh, Nevadans who are out of work, who want to get back to work and who we want to help get back to work and ensure that they can return to their jobs and recognizing that if their circumstances are such that they can't go back today or tomorrow, we're not going to penalize them for that because um, all of us are struggling in the pandemic to balance a lot of responsibilities, responsibilities that we never had before, never expected to have. And I think that um, we we should be getting people back to work as soon as possible. Um, and I want to thank you for bringing legislation. Thank you, um, Senator okay. Sitt and then Senator Hardy. I'm sorry, S Senator Scheibel, were you... I'm sorry, Senator Scheibel? I, I was done. It sounded like maybe Senator Canazaro was going to weigh in. Okay. Nope. Okay. okay. Nope. Just. Okay. Uh, Senator, then Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm just curious how this legislation mirrors some of the, you know, since it was brought up, some of the other legislation that was done in other states, you know, recognizing, of course, that, you know, Governor of California vetoed it, saying that it was too prescriptive and threatens to hurt an already devastated hospitality industry. I was just curious how this potentially burdens from it, because I'm very concerned that this will put yet more onerous regulations and rules onto an industry that's already hurting and struggling to survive from a government-imposed economic crisis. Um, let me address, I appreciate that detail from you out here. appreciate that, Senator. Uh, he did veto that last summer uh, based on certain conditions. And I am very confident that that uh, bill has been redone much in the line of this bill and will get passed in the next week or two. So we're very confident in that in the state of California. So if we wanna follow California, um, so be it. Uh, it uh, but that, that bill is going to get done in California 
uh, just like it'll get done in Minnesota too. Um, uh, and be glad to compare not only those bills, but also what's been passed in numerous cities across the United States uh, that certainly have not had the impact of layoffs like we have in Nevada because they're not as reliant on the hospitality industry. So uh, that's one. Second, um, Paul, if you and Nicole want to answer some of the other questions, be more than glad to. But I want to clarify that for the senator, and I appreciate the question. And um, uh, like I said, uh, we in Nevada usually don't follow California, but uh, that bill will pass and uh, uh, be glad to bring that over because it's, uh, it's a very, very good bill. Uh, Paul or Nicole, if you have any comments based on the senator's questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Taylor, and, and to you, Senator Settlemeyer and Nicole Canizaro, six. I think what's unique here is that this really is legislation that is designed to deal with the very unique crisis that we have here in Nevada. Um, again, I think we and we have seen not only here in the United States but across the world that there were precautions that had to be taken to ensure the safety of our communities and to ensure that we were mitigating what is a global pandemic um, that threatens people's lives. And so I, you know, I, everyone is feeling the effects of that. I think particularly here in Nevada, uh, we are in such a unique position because of our reliance on tourism to help fuel the state's economy. And the very premise of that industry being able to operate is exactly these workers. And so what I'm, what may be in a different context, under different circumstances um, might have been seen as over prescriptive. I think what this committee's, um, hopefully what this committee's task is that will be considered by the members here today and what this legislature will look at is what is really best for Nevada and what is pro provided for you in Senate Bill 386 is a Nevada specific oh. solution. You're talking about our hospitality workers. We're talking about those who really do function as the core of our economic drivers and how it is that we are helping to bring them back to work in a way that that makes sense. Um, you know, nothing about this, I think, uh, is asking for employers to undertake an enormous amount of responsibility. They know who they have laid off and we're asking for them to ensure to those workers that as business starts to come back, those folks who are filling those jobs, who filled those jobs until the day that those doors shut, um, who have seniority and are capable and qualified to fill those jobs are the folks who are there going to be bringing back. Um, and I think that this is a very unique solution to what is a very unique crisis here. Um, and the sooner that we can actually get those workers back to work, start to rebuild that, the sooner Nevada is going to start to recover. I appreciate that. Let's talk specifically to the bill on section 23, which is on page eight of the bill I'm looking at, uh, or actually 22 on sub three, an employer may extend simultaneous conditional offers of employment to laid off employees with a final offer of employment conditioned on the application of the order of preference set forth in subparagraph one and two of paragraph B of subsection one. That seems a little bit confusing to me, but is that basically just stating that it doesn't matter the ability of an individual or seniority, or am I reading that incorrectly? Um, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, Nicole Canizaro, Senate District 6. As I read this, and I'll invite Mr. Moore to correct me if I am wrong uh, in in how this, this section works, which I understand is a, a little complicated when you look at it. That subsection 3, which is actually section 22, um, subsection three on page eight of the bill that talks about this the simultaneous conditional offers they can they can and mr moore mentioned this extend a pool of offers to those employees that are qualified and the the qualifications here that say conditioned on application of the order of preference set forth in sub paragraphs one and two of paragraph b is here um, on page seven under section 22 which talks about the employee being qualified for that position or a, for the same or similar position or for which they can be easily trained for. Um, and where you see there in subsection two, where it talks about the um, seniority pieces, 
of someone who has had the greatest length of service for the covered enterprise. Um, so we're talking about employees who are qualified to do those jobs. Um, and I think one of the references that was made, for example, if you are someone who is a porter and maybe now part of your job duties also includes some additional disinfecting or cleaning standards um, for the purpose of COVID, that's easy training that it could entitle them to continue in that job position with a few additional job duties um, and where they have that greatest length of service for that seniority pieces, that's what we're talking about. So it's not just um, without respect to that, those are the qualifications that that subsection three is referring to. Thank you, Majority Leader and Chair. Thank you. Okay, Senator Hart. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I, I'm on the same hang up, I guess I'll call it, on page eight, um, subsection three, and then it goes down to subsection five. So my basic question is if we have somebody who has a similar position, uh, but they have to have training, you know, is there, when I look at the job fair, for instance, I'll call it a job fair on subsec subsection three, top of page eight. Uh, when that job fair happens, uh, because everybody got in the mail that we're going to have a job fair and they weren't able to go to the job fair and they weren't able to, and somebody else got a similar position that they were in, but they're qualified to be trained as the bill talks about on subsection five, um, is there protection for the employer so that they can say there is no appeal uh, for the uh, employee, the former employee who was qualified, can that former employee appeal, take it to court, or is that not allowed? Because as I see it in subsection five of section 22, it has nothing that says the former employee who didn't get brought back, but somebody else got brought back, even though they weren't qualified, that they can't appeal or they can't, uh, take that to court. Is there any language that will um, protect the employer from that happening? Um, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. So here in, in section five, um, if I'm understanding your, your, your question here, where it does talk about an employer who declines to recall someone who was laid off, um, where that employee lacks those qualifications, where they end up hiring someone else uh, because that employee um, did not within that 10 days um, accept that offer. There are provisions where if this is being enforced by an employee, right, who still has to show that prima facie case that they complied with all the subsections of this particular act, that the employer took an action within the 60 day time frame, um, and that the employer after the employee had exercised all of their rights under this act, which I think is an important piece. Um, so they would have had to have responded within that 10 days to that particular um, offer that the employer must then thereafter refuse to employ, terminate, demote, or otherwise take an adverse action against the employee those all have to be established, but that rebuttable presumption is um, defeated by the business offering. You can see that in section 24, subsection three, a legitimate business reason for that. So I think there are a couple of safeguards here. One where you're seeing that that employee um, doesn't respond within the provisions and the timelines as delineated in the act in section 22, um, subparagraph four where an employer who is not going to recall an employee because they don't have the proper qualifications under section five, they are entitled to do that as well. And then additionally, let's say an employee wanted to take action against an employer. First, they have to prove that they complied with all the provisions of the act. And also, by the way, that there wasn't somebody who was hired who um, had the qualifications where that employee lacked those qualifications. But then also there is an, um, a provision where the employer can rebut that presumption 
by providing that legitimate business reason. I mean, that's exactly my point is that the employee is going to say, wait a minute, I got a letter that said I couldn't be hired because they didn't have the qualifications, but Joe Blow got hired even though he was trainable, he didn't have the qualifications. So why should he be hired and I not be hired? And therefore I'm, even though I did everything uh, and I got a letter that said, no, we didn't hire you because you weren't qualified or because you didn't show up at the job fair. And therefore I'm not happy and I think I am just as qualified as the person who was hired because he wasn't qualified either. And so the employer now is having to say, well, I've got a rebuttable presumption and so you don't have a leg to stand on. And the employee is going to say, that's not fair. But if we put something in the bill that says that that in section, subsection five, then I think that would protect employers. Right now, I think the employer is going to be uh, liable. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Senator. Nicole Canizaro, Senate District 6. Uh, and, and I do understand what you're getting at is to ensure that the employer has sufficient safeguards um, such that they're not opening themselves up to having um, frivolous lawsuits filed or frivolous complaints or employees who are simply mad because they, they didn't get recalled for a position that, that, they, that they were entitled to. Um, I would first note that, that one of the key pieces of this bill is that these really are, and I know I've, I've said this before in this hearing, but um, I just think it's such an important thing to keep in mind is that these are employees who up until the date that those doors shut on that particular business were working this same job. That's what we are really getting at, right? And sometimes there's additional things that go along with that job, especially in the area um, of COVID response and making sure that we're dealing with that. So if they can be readily trainable, that's why we have some additional definitions in there, right? So these are employees who, who were employed, who are folks who had been hired and, and were simply laid off because of the pandemic. Um, I, again, I think what we're trying to get at with the language here, and perhaps we need some clarification, is to ensure that where that employee, you know, didn't, for example, show up to the job fair, they don't, they did not meet the qualifications, don't have a prima facie case um, under the provisions of this act. They have to also comply with all of the provisions here. And sometimes there may be complaints um, put forward, but the employer comes in and says, well, actually you didn't show up and there's no prima facie case. So we don't even get to a rebuttable presumption because they haven't even met those standards. Um, where somebody is not qualified, I think it is um, easy if an employer is really making decisions based upon bringing those employees that they had hired and were working for them back, that where they don't have those same qualifications, that person can't do that job, is very easy to say, well, this person <laughs> can't do that job. This is a completely different job. They don't have the qualifications. Um, again, there's no, there's no case there. Um, and so we are trying to provide sufficient safeguards to employers um, while also asking them to take into consideration that these folks who were laid off due to no fault of, of their own um, can come back to work. Thank you. I think something else can be done, but I think the overall intent is good. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Taylor, is that your hand up? Do you have, Mr. Taylor, do you have additional comments? Because we still have two bills to hear and I want to move to support. Um, I just want, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Senator Neal D. Taylor from Unite Here. Um, I just want to remind the senators, and I appreciate Senator Hardy, your questions, that we're not talking about new workers. We're talking about the exact workforce that was in these properties or at these airports or convention centers for many times 20, 30, or 40 years. So that's number one, because I think somehow or another that's gotten lost. Number two, um, if this is in place, they don't have to worry about a job fair, right? 
because <laughs> they get recalled or they have the option of being recalled as uh, we've described. So I, I often think we forget that we're, as Senator Conazario said, we're talking about an experienced workforce that's been doing the job in many cases for over 30 years. And what we are very cognizant of is if this does not go into law, many of these same longer term older workers are going to be displaced and fired. And as I sat and talked to a 62 year old housekeeper who now has been fired from her job of over 18 years, she said, who's gonna hire me? And if I do get hired, what kind of pay are they gonna offer somebody like me? Well, you know, frankly, that's exactly why I know you're in the legislature to make sure all the Nevadans get a fair shot. And all these workers are asking for is just giving an opportunity to go back to work. Uh, you know, the workers in this industry uh, typically often are single mothers. And if anybody needs a job, obviously they want to provide for their kids, not the kids provide for them. And I appreciate the senator your question and all the senators and taking attention to this issue because it's so vitally important. Okay, thank you for that. So we will go ahead and uh, BPS go to support. So for support, we're gonna be doing two minutes each, uh, 15 minutes each side, 15 minutes support, opposition neutral. Thank you, Vice Chair. To testify in support of SB 386, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 237. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 237, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Moving to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 531, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning. My name is Cristina Lopez. I have lived in Nevada for 10 years, and I used to work at the station casinos, Texas Station. We had just bought a home we all saved in February 2020, and then the pandemic hit. I was laid off in March 2020, and I have not heard from the station casino since. They terminated me in May 2020. I have not given me the hope to go back to my job. My family and I have been surviving with unemployment benefits. All the extra money we get, like the stimulus checks, we save so that we can pay for our mortgage. Now, I have credit card debt that I didn't have before. This pandemic has been a hard struggle for our family. I had a 12-year-old daughter, and my elderly mother lives with us. I have no extra money this day. And I have to be very careful of what I buy at the grocery store. This crisis is not our fault. It took us all by surprise. I had applied at 15 different jobs, but I am told that I am overqualified to work at fast food restaurants or that I don't have enough experience for another job. The only hope I have is for my job to come back to the way it was. I am a good person. I had worked hard for a station casino for 10 years. I need hope and the right to return to my chat. Please support LSB 386. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Caller with the last digits of 486. 
Please press star six now to unmute yourself. Sorry, Chair, Vice Chair, we seem to be having technical difficulties. Caller with the last three digits of 486. Hello, there are you we go. good? Yes, please slowly right, spell and state your last everyone. name for the record. Please begin. Hi, good uh, morning, Alexander Marks, M-A-R-K-S with the Nevada State Education Association. NSDA has been the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSDA supports Senate Bill 386, which will give thousands of unemployed workers in Nevada the right to return to their jobs. As an important labor partner, NSCA has worked very closely with the Culinary Union during the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate that tens of thousands of students in our schools have parents in the hospitality industry and have had their lives upended by the pandemic. The safe reopening of school buildings is only one part of getting students through the other side of this pandemic. The ability of their parents to return to their jobs would provide the economic stability necessary for students to be able to arrive at school truly ready to learn. Educators know this is too often not the case when students struggle at home with issues of food insecurity, housing instability, and parents facing the stresses of unemployment and not being able to provide for their family. SB 386 is the right thing to do for labor and will also help thousands of Nevada students. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 658. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Michael Gibbings, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-G-I-T-T-I-N-G-S. I'm the president of United Food and Commercial Workers and Local 711, and I'm here to speak in support of SB 386. Tens of thousands of Nevada's workers have lost their jobs as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and due to no fault of their own. Workers should get their jobs back when businesses reopen. The right to return legislation is a common sense measure that is urgently needed to create stability in Nevada's workforce. We stand firmly with all Nevada workers in calling on the Nevada legislature to stand with working and pass Senate Bill 386. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 796. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Rusty McAllister, R-U-S-T-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R. I'm the Executive Secretary Treasurer for the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of our 150,000 plus members, we are in support of Senate Bill 386. Madam Chairman of the Committee, this is, this is a common sense bill. This is simply an issue of putting people back to work. This shouldn't be hard. I think probably one of the, the best indicators of, of what we're talking about here is you know I just saw in the news a couple of days ago that one of the large one of our large hotel companies here in Las Vegas was advertising for workers in the hospitality industry. There's already workers for those jobs. They were the ones that got laid off when this pandemic started. They're the ones sitting there waiting to get their jobs back. This is not hard. It's a trained workforce, and they're ready to go to work. Let's pass this bill and let's get people back working. This is not a complex issue. Just hire the people back that were laid off through no fault of their own. When the governor asked everybody to step up to the plate, they did. Don't penalize them because they did what they were asked to do. Do the right thing. Put people back to work and let's save this state. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 486. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Uh, good morning. This is James Kemp, J-A-M-E-S-K-E-M-P. Uh, good morning, Chair and Committee members. I'm J.P. Kemp on behalf of the Nevada Justice Association, and we are in support of SB 386. 
and the protections uh, it will provide to Nevada employees uh, who have uh, suffered layoffs during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we ditto and echo the others that are in support. Uh, we think it's a good bill and uh, urge uh, your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 093. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 093, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Thank you, please begin. Uh, chairman, uh, members of the committee, Randy Saltero, R-A-N-D-Y, S-O-L-T-E-R-O, -E um, calling in support of SB 386. Uh, I've had the uh, pleasure or honor or distinction of being able to work on behalf of labor unions for the last 20 plus years. And uh, that this, this bill is just something that, uh, you know, the COVID has, has made a lot of hard, bad things happen to people's families with the uh, loss of life, but even having to experience uh, job insecurity because of it is, is another uh, very, very hard thing to have to deal with. Uh, I believe SB 386 would help to curb that and I stand in support. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 053, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, Chair, uh, committee. My name is Mario Sandoval, M-A-R-I-O-S-A-N-D-O-V-A-L. I was a food server at uh, Binion Steakhouse on Fremont Street, downtown Las Vegas. I had been a culinary union member for 39 years. I was raised here in Las Vegas. I started working downtown Las Vegas when I was 16 years old. I am testifying in support of SB 386 today and asked the Nevada legislature to pass a return to work law that would protect workers like me who have lost our jobs due to COVID-19 and through no fault of our own. Companies should not waste time and money trying to hire and train new people when there are people like me with so much experience just waiting for our workplace to bring us back. I should not be replaced or abandoned. I have spent my life working for this company. I should not have to start my career over when I am so close to retiring with dignity. Knowing I have a job to return to would give me hope, and hope can take me a long way. I love my job. I have good pay, health benefits. I live comfortably. My job to help me raise my four kids. I dream about it. That's all I have are those dreams. But I could have hope if I was guaranteed my job back. Something the company has taken away from us. Support SB36. 386, which would allow me the right to return to my that I had for 36 years. In closing, I want you to know I'm a shot steward, labor activist, voiced to many of my employees, and I believe without SB 386, I will not be returning to my job. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 515. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Madam, or I'm sorry, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Phil James, P-H-I-L-J-A-Y-N as in Nancy E-S. I'm the president of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, Local 720 in Las Vegas. I'm calling in support of Senate Bill 386. The core of this bill is very simple. If you lost your job because of COVID-19, you will get you'll get your job back when your job comes back. Unfortunately, not everyone has protections of the CBA. This would protect those workers along with the workers whose recall rights have expired per their CPA because nobody foresaw a worldwide pandemic that would require a lengthy shutdown. I, I strongly support this bill because it is fair and it's the right thing to do. 
Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 417. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last ridges of 417, we can see you are unmuted. Can you begin your testimony, please? Caller. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, sorry. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Haley Box, H-A-L-E-Y-B-O-X, and I'm a staff attorney for Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, and I'm calling in support of SB 386. I represent the 60,000 plus culinary and bartenders union members and their families who are the heart of the Nevada hospitality industry. After the shutdown in March of 2020, 98% of these workers became unemployed overnight through no fault of their own, and 50 and 60% of these employees remain either fully or partially unemployed to this day. Most of these employees have never been out of work and have 10, 20, 30, or even 40 years of experience in the hospitality industry. Now they are faced with the question of will they be given the opportunity to return to their jobs. Unemployment is the root cause of many other issues that have a negative impact on our local economy. I've been assisting laid off hospitality employees in navigating a vastly inadequate unemployment compensation system, deal with the resulting housing crisis, both evictions and foreclosures, car repossessions, debt collection, bankruptcy, and the list goes on. The uncertainty and fear of not being able to return to work and potentially losing the homes they've worked so hard for and worrying about how they will put food on the table for their families and children has had an extremely negative impact on their mental health and overall well-being. Senate Bill 386 will ensure that these experienced employees who are well established within the community will have the opportunity to return to their jobs which will in turn help the economy of Nevada recover more quickly. We must protect our service employees as they are the backbone and the steam engine of our entire community and economy. Getting our hospitality workers back into their jobs and ensuring that they are not terminated in exchange for less experienced but cheaper labor will be the driving force behind the faster recovery for our state. If enacted, this bill will help alleviate our housing crisis that is only going to worsen with the looming end of the statewide eviction moratorium on May 1st and boost oh, Nevada's economy, helping us all get back to where we were before this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 390, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Brendan Geyer. Good morning. My name is Brendan Geyer, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-G-E-Y-E-R. I have been a bartender in Main Street Station in downtown Las Vegas for 25 years. I have been laid off since March 2020 when this COVID-19 pandemic started. I never thought it was possible for Las Vegas to shut down. I felt devastated not knowing what is going to happen next. Throughout the past year, I have been collecting unemployment benefits and wondering every day when I'm gonna go back to work. My wife is working, so luckily we haven't had to apply for housing or utilities assistance. But if I'm not able to go back to my job when things get better, I don't know what we will do. For the past year, I have had to watch every penny and make hard decisions about my bills. I get food assistance to try to make every dollar stretch. The culinary and bartenders unions have really helped us to get through this pandemic. I go once a week to the Helping Hand Food Assistance Program to get fresh groceries. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have that support. I have been faithful and devoted to Main Street Station Casino for 25 years, and all I'm asking for is the right to be able to return to that job that I do so well. Us workers make the hospitality industry successful in the good times. Now I think we deserve to go back to those jobs. I have been a union member for 30 years, I am fighting for the right to return to my job. <clears throat> I am asking 
the legislators that help us by supporting Bill 386, which would give us the right to return to our job. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 673. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair, <clears throat> members of the committee. My name is Fran, F-R-A-N, Almarez, A-L-M-A-R-A-Z. Thank you for hearing SB 386. I am calling in support of SB 386, representing approximately 3,000 Teamsters in the hospitality industry in Las Vegas. They have been out of work for over a year. Some of their positions have already been outsourced without them ever getting a call back to work. We believe this bill will ensure a path to rehire. I ask you to support SB 386. Thank you. Thank you, caller. If you recently just joined us, we are currently on support of SB 386. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 881. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. The broadcast this is the Thank last you. call. Thank you. My, my name is Edward Goodrich, G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H, and I'm calling on in support of the, and I urge the committee to support SB 386. Uh, while I was waiting, I read the opposition letters to this legislation, and I've got to commend Station Casinos on their extraordinary effort. They're taking, using their positive cash position to support their employees in these trying times. Unfortunately, this is not the case statewide. There's a great deal of uncertainty regarding reemployment when we come out of this broad pandemic. In its broadest strokes, this legislation offers the right of first refusal to those laid off through no fault of their own. As stewards of the state, I see it as necessary for this committee to support this legislation in order to support the dual yet conflicting goals of taking every step possible to reduce the hemorrhage of money on the state coffers via unemployment benefits and to maintain the same as social safety net at the same time. Removing the uncertainty in reemployment, especially to the more senior workers who are justifiably worried if their company will bring them back or look for a younger, cheaper person instead. This is important. They wonder if their company is run by people who will increase, their, who will increase the burden on the state in order to look after their own bottom line. I therefore urge the committee to support SB 386. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Chair, you have no more callers left in support at this time. Um, thank you. And um, before I went over, and I think maybe about uh, four minutes, so we're going to allow the same time for opposition. Okay. 19 minutes. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. To testify in opposition of SB 386, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 550, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 550. Thank yes. you. Please begin. Can you hear me? Yes, can we can you hear me. Yes. My name is Ann Silver, A-N-N-S-I-L-V-E-R. Uh, good morning, Chair Spearman, members of the committee. As an employee, a former HR professional, and the CEO of the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce, representing 2,000-plus businesses, it was painful to read SB 386. Is the intent of this bill to regulate an employer's rehiring process and manda mandate how thousands of tourism-related businesses must operate during and immediately after the pandemic? No employer likes to do layoffs, but this bill attempts to guarantee rights typically seen only in collective bargaining agreements that cover layoffs, recall, and seniority. 
Who in small tourism-related businesses will write all the required notification letters, confirm addresses, monitor the 10-day response time, pay for the stamps, the use of the fax machine, or the labor involved in compliance with this bill? Why are we all working so hard to restart our economy, refill jobs, and restore the dignity of work while handcuffing the businesses that will create the economic rebound? Why diminish the entrepreneurial spirit and fail to recognize what it has taken to weather through this pandemic? There are federal and state laws to protect against discrimination and unfair labor practices, and there is enough work for lawyers. Let's not create new legislation that begs for litigation and class action lawsuits. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 114. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Greetings, Chair, members of the committee. Amber Stidham, that's S-T-I-D-H-A-M, for the Henderson Chamber. Our chamber recognizes the issue that this proposal seeks to fix. However, tying provisions to Nevada State of Emergency without consideration of county and local oversight, the entities that move at different times and in different ways to meet the still developing challenges that we encounter during this pandemic, all of which directly impacts how businesses can operate, only creates confusion and a patchwork of requirements that are too prescriptive and does hurt our already devastated hospitality industry and other small businesses. Our businesses continue to struggle in keeping their doors over open still now. Many of them have had to make the tough and terrible decision to lay off their valued hardworking team members as a result. And now that we're about a year into the various state mandated closures and business restrictions at varying degrees, um, it's also important to remember that some businesses continue to be mandated to operate at challenging capacities. Some remain closed altogether. We understand the emergency directives that occurred in 2020. It was to protect the health of Nevadans, and that is incredibly important. But as written, this legislation is overly burdensome and creates more barriers for those businesses already bare bones who are operating still within an unclear environment as a result of the uncertain times that we're operating in. A particularly challenging thing for our employers to discern is what jobs are, quote, similar as outlined in Section 22, and how to adhere to all of those notification regulations vaguely laid out within this bill as most businesses have completely reimagined their business models. And let me be clear and add that most employers already choose to rehire laid off employees because they have that experience and can transition their skills to meet these newly imagined jobs. What is also very concerning though, is that this bill could also now force businesses to defend themselves from major lawsuits as this proposal creates a retroactive right that is contrary to businesses' foundational understanding of existing employment law in Nevada. The passage of SB 386 would also result in substantial litigation of paramount concern, Section 23, which outlines an extremely punitive measures, including trouble damages payable to a former employee. And I just want to close and say that our chamber desperately wants all of us, all of us to be in a place that we can look forward. And given the devastation our state has experienced, we do have a long road to recovery. We want employers focused on building back their business that raises all, right, all, of, us, are up. all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 300. Please slowly spell and get your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Barry Lieberman, B-A-R-R-Y-L-I-E-B-E-R-M-A-N. I am an attorney employed by the South Point Hotel and Casino, and I'm here to speak in opposition to SB 386. The South Point is a family-owned and run business and has been successfully operated for many years. SB 386, like many other bills introduced in this legislative session, quite frankly, seek to impose additional costs on businesses and micromanage how private businesses in Nevada operate. This is a dangerous trend in my opinion. The South Point kept almost all its employees on the payroll for more than a month after the state mandated shutdown of casinos. When the South Point was finally financially forced to furlough some employees, we continued to pay very costly health insurance premiums so that the furloughed employees could continue to receive health insurance. We are making it easy and free for our employees to get COVID vaccinations. These decisions were made by a man concerned for the welfare of his employees, 
while trying to balance the tremendous financial hardship that the South Point had to endure. SB 386 now seeks to tell us how we should manage the recall of employees as business gets better. The provisions of the bill create burdensome, time-consuming, and counterproductive requirements, which will significantly impede rehiring of employees and further delay bringing back employees. The bill is unnecessary and has burdensome and costly provisions that will only delay our recovery. Our business is recovering and we are rehiring employees. We don't need the state of Nevada telling us how to rehire our employees and which employees to rehire. This bill, like many of the other bills introduced in this session, harm Nevada businesses. We strongly believe that the provisions of SB 386 are unnecessary and the bill should not be enacted. Thank you for your consideration of our position. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 298. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and the members of the committee. For the record, Gina Bonjovi, G-I-N-A-B-O-N-G-I-O-V-I, -I -I, Managing Partner of Bon Jovi Law Firm and Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Vegas Chamber. I would like to thank the Senate Majority Leader for meeting with members of the business community about SB 386 so we could share our concerns with some of the provisions of the bill and how it would impact Nevada's employers, especially as we all work together to bring more Nevadans back to work. We appreciate the time that she always generously gives and for the dialogue that we've had about the bill. Some of those concerns include the proposed legal remedies without rebuttable presumptions as discussed earlier, damages components, several definitions, um, specifically that of employer, the notification process and the overall impact it can have on the larger business community. I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you what our members have done during the COVID-19 pandemic. As board chair for the Vegas Chamber, I recognize and appreciate how our members have stepped up to help their fellow Nevadans during the pandemic, even though their own operations were in jeopardy. If employers provide salary, care benefits, grants, financial assistance to employees, even when their businesses were closed during the pandemic. They provided time off to employees to get tested, to take care of loved ones, homeschool their children, and be there for their families. We had the private sector donate food and supplies to nonprofits to support their fellow Nevadans. Even though they had no legal obligation to do so, they did it because it was the right thing to do. And they did it because they care about their employees, they care about our community, and they care about our state. And now as we are working to get Nevadans vaccinated quickly, employers are supporting these efforts and working with health officials to have on-site vaccine centers for employees, providing time off to get vaccinated, and debunking anti-vaccination myths. They're doing all this, even though many businesses are still operating at only 50% capacity per state directives in efforts to slow the spread. This has not been easy on our employers as there's been some sort of restrictions or closures on businesses since March 2020. It is for the foregoing reasons that the Chamber cannot support SB 386 today. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 435. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, my name is Chris Brown, it's B-R-O-W-N. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Air Carrier Association, a trade association that represents four passenger airlines serving the Karen International Airport. The pandemic has devastated many businesses across the country, and airlines and their airport partners are, of course, no exception. U.S. airlines have lost over $50 billion. Our airport partners have lost more than $40 billion, and the aviation industry has lost over 100,000 full-time jobs. We recognize and are extremely grateful for the hard work of our airport service providers working above and below wing every day, helping you and your families get to the places you need to be even in the face of a global pandemic. Our airlines depend greatly upon their airport partners and we respect and understand their interests in being in control of their properties. The efficient operation of our airports and service providers keeps the cost to the flying public low, which in turn opens up flying to more people and increases travel to world-class leisure destinations like Las Vegas and Reno. If costs of doing business at airports increase, airfares will inevitably rise. Higher fares will reduce passenger demand at McCarran, which will undermine the travel and tourism recovery in Nevada. Therefore, we respectively oppose SB 386. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 332. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. 
Morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Andrew Diss, A-N-D-R-E-W-D-I-S-S, -S, and I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for Morello Gaming, and I'm here in opposition to SB 386. Some of our specific concerns stem from the lack of clarity on if and when the recall provisions in our CBAs will govern. We currently have recall provisions in place. We are following the contract language and the system is working. So this bill should clarify that it does not apply to team members that are covered by a CBA, or if it does, then it should clarify what happens if the CBA provisions conflict with what's in this bill. Additionally, the requirements under section 22 will create an extraordinary burden to our HR departments and could potentially create a big area of litigation where a court would have to step in and serve as a super HR department in determining whether it was proper to hire one employee over another because of differences in experience and seniority. This is an inappropriate judicial determination that will add to our already overburdened courts. And finally, I have to say that we find it highly offensive and outrageous that Mr. Taylor would say that resort operators treat team members like a pair of old shoes to be thrown out. Let me be very clear. Our most valuable asset as a company is our people. The only reason we are successful is because of our team members, and we have done everything we can to support them during the course of this pandemic, including maintaining all of our team members' health insurance so that nobody lost coverage during the shutdown, not a single person. We provide free on-site rapid COVID testing at all of our properties, and by working with the local health district, we have hosted on-site at-work vaccination pods for our team members and their families. It has been a difficult year for all of us, but it's important we don't mistakenly direct our frustration at one another. We all need to work together to stay safe, get vaccinated, and defeat this virus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 058. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Keith Lee, K-E-I-T-H-L-E-E. -E -E. Uh, I represent Southwest Airlines. Uh, like every other business, commercial air carriers and their valued employees have felt the impact of COVID-19. Across every sector, we recognize the sacrifices our working men and women have made and the hardships they have endured during this unprecedented pandemic. And we want them to be able to get back to work as soon as possible. However, commercial air carriers depend greatly upon our airport allies, and we respect their interests in wanting to be in control of their properties. Efficient operation of our airports keeps the cost to our flying public down. We support the autonomy of our airport partners in dealing with their vendors. We understand McCarran International has some current concerns, particularly with Section 7 and 8 uh, of uh, the bill, and we support McCarran's concerns and their efforts in uh, addressing their concerns with section with respect to section seven and eight and in closing i will just echo the comments of my colleague chris brown with the national air carriers association uh, and we thank you for uh, your attention thank you caller caller with the last three digits of 813 please slowly spell and state your name for the record you have two minutes and may begin Good morning, Chair Spearman, members of the committee. For the record, Aaron Midby, M-I, D as in David, B as in boy, Y, on behalf of Boyd Gaming Corporation. I'm here today to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 386. Although we had to make some very difficult decisions during the closures, Boyd Gaming was committed and remains committed to helping our team members throughout the crisis. Our team members are critical to our success. Without them, we cannot welcome guests and provide the level of service that makes Las Vegas a world-class tourism destination. During the height of the pandemic, we initially continued full pay for all team members, including tip income, for the greater portion of the time our properties were closed. We then continued to pay 100% of health insurance premiums for furloughed team members through July 31st. Although we had to temporarily suspend pay increases during the closure, we gave raises to all eligible hourly team members in October. To provide some stability for our team members, we also froze our 2021 health premiums at last year's levels and suspended hours worked eligibility so our team members were able to keep their insurance benefits despite furloughs. Additionally, we supported SB4 during the special session as the health and safety of our team members is of utmost importance. We recently implemented a vaccine policy to encourage all of our team members to get vaccinated. This includes relaxed attendance policy and flexible work hours to make it as convenient for team members as possible. Team members can also get PTO reimbursement once completing the vaccine. Since the shutdown, Void Gaming has brought more than 6,000 team members back to work and are continually bringing more back as we gradually ramp our business back up. 
In fact, we currently have over 300 job openings across multiple functions, including food and beverage, security, hotel, and administrative, and we expect many more to open up as we continue through recovery. Despite our efforts to do everything possible to get people back to work, we're still struggling to fill our open positions. SB 386 will not help us get back people back to work. It will simply create one, just one more barrier in getting people back to work quickly. We believe that this bill is unnecessary at this time. Team members are being brought back and we are hiring. And at a time when we are working toward recovery, this bill will only create burdensome, time-consuming, and counterproductive requirements, which will only delay our efforts to timely rehire as many team members as possible. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 651. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Spearman, members of the committee. I'm Michael Alonso, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-L-O-N-S-O, and I'm here on behalf of Caesars Entertainment, Inc. We appreciate Senate Majority Leader uh, Ken Azaro bringing this bill to address the very important issue of bringing back employees in the leisure and hospitality sectors in this state in the post-pandemic recovery period. However, for reasons already covered by other speakers, and I believe Bob Ostrowski will address the bill uh, specifically, Caesars is opposed to this bill. Caesars as a company cares deeply for its team members and has always made the well-being of its team members its highest priority. Caesars and its Nevada properties supported its team members during the pandemic and continues to support its team members in many critical ways. For example, in connection with pay and benefits, for team members who were impacted by closures, the company provided closure pay at a level of no less than two weeks of straight time pay and up to six to eight weeks with tips and tokes for legacy ERI properties in addition to providing pay during subsequent temporary closures here and in other various states. In Nevada, Caesars has paid out over $30 million to team members as part of closure pay. Upon reopening, Caesars provided 10 COVID sick days for those testing positive or in, contract with, uh, or in contact with COVID at work or in a household. This is above and beyond the company's usual and customary sick time and time off policies. In Nevada, Caesars has paid uh, just under $9 million to team members as part of the COVID sick pay policy. For those team members on the company's sponsored benefit plan, Caesars continued to provide and pay for continued benefits coverage for our team members and their covered dependents throughout the entire period including those who remain on furlough day. Those continued benefits include mental health support and resources to team members through employee assistance programs and insurance programs. Unfortunately, during the pandemic and on the heels of the integration of a very large merger, Caesars had to eliminate some positions in Nevada as well. In these situations, Caesars provided continuation pay, which is severance or benefit continuation under COBRA with a subsidy. The company paid the individuals who were impacted in 2020 approximately $35 million in severance pay and for 2021 year to date has paid over $4.5 million. In addition, Caesar's policy is that these roles are two minutes are up. from the effective date. Thank you, caller. Thank you. Yeah, submit your testimony in writing um, and broadcast. Unfortunately, we are over the 19 minutes, so we'll stop there. Uh, we'll go to Neutral. Thank you, Chair. To testify neutral on SB 386, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify neutral on SB 386, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. One more time. If you'd like to testify neutral on SB 386, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 237. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, committee. I am Marlene Lockhart representing SEIU 1107. And I apologize, I was on the line to testify in support, uh, but got dropped apparently. So I wanted to very quickly add our support of SB 386. Um, we are in strong support of this bill. While this pandemic has affected everyone, 
It is the workers who have borne the brunt of the crisis from losing their jobs and in many cases, even unable to get unemployment benefits. Most workers don't have a nest egg to sustain them through this unanticipated crisis. Now that the state is moving to reopen, it is unconscionable to block their return to work. We urge your favorable consideration of SB 386. Thank you. Thank you, caller. If you recently just joined us, we are currently neutral on SB 386. To testify neutral, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers neutral at this time. Thank you. Um, Madam Majority Leader, uh, you have any closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. I again just wanted to thank members of the committee for allowing us to be here to present what I really do feel is um, an incredibly important piece of legislation to give assurances to the folks who really keep this state running. Um, we know that our hospitality industry is the backbone of Nevada's economy. We've seen that play out. We know that Nevada is in such a much more detrimental place than a lot of other places as a result of the effects of the pandemic. And when we're talking about how do we start to build back stronger, how do we start to invest again um, in the state of Nevada and help everyone to recover, um, workers are a critical piece of that. And that is exactly what this bill is seeking to do. Um, I understand that there are uh, objections and, and opposition out there. Again, I remain committed to sitting down and trying to work this out so that we can find a path forward. Um, but at the end of the day, this is really a question about whether or not those workers who ended up losing their jobs um, through no fault of their own can have some assurance that they are going to be able to return to work, that they're going to be able to support their families, that they are going to be able to continue to make a living. Um, this is a personal point of privilege. You know, my parents moved here because they were a bartender and a waitress and they were looking for a place where they could do that and be able to raise a family. We were able to do that here in Nevada. This is my home state. Las Vegas is my hometown. Um, and I'm a proud, I am their very proud daughter for the hard work that they did. Um, and these workers are just asking for a chance to be able to go back to work, to do exactly what my parents were able to do for me. Um, and I think we, uh, we should be invested enough in them as they are in our community, in our state, um, to provide them that assurance. So thank you again for the hearing. Again, we're gonna to continue to work um, on this issue and hoping that we can come to a resolution for those who really do need it. Um, but thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you members of the committee. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, riveting, riveting testimony. Um, it struck me as I was listening to the gentleman um, who wanted his job back to feed his family. I think that's what he said. Um, before COVID-19, um, we called these workers minimum wage workers. COVID-19 hit and they became essential workers. So. We'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 386, and uh, we will open the hearing on SB 252. And just before, Senator Picker, just before you proceed, uh, we're going to roll Senate Bill 186 to tomorrow. Uh, so if you're, you're here to testify um, for or against 186, that will be tomorrow, okay? Um, Senator Picker, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Keith Pickard, representing Senate District 20 in Clark County and Henderson. I'm here to present Senate Bill 252, which should be a much lighter lift. Uh, Senate Bill 252 was requested by several families and clients within my district that have struggled with having warranties abandoned by contractors who offered them in order to land the project. 
Before I begin my formal remarks, I want to express my uh, appreciation to the various contractor organizations and the contractors board who assisted in the framing of this bill. I will say from the outset that most licensed contractors honor their contracts, including their warranties, without hesitation. Indeed, many go beyond the terms of their warranty to fix problems that arise in their customers' homes, if only to have a happy customer who will give them a high rating on consumer rating services like Yelp and Angie's List. But a few typically smaller, less ethical operators will offer a long warranty with the hope of securing the work only to abandon that agreement after four years. First, a little history. The Nevada Contractors Board was established in 1931 for the sole purpose of protecting consumers from unscrupulous contractors. In 1981, the Nevada legislature added the following declaration, quote, the legislature declares that the provisions of this chapter relating to the discipline of licensees are intended to promote public confidence and trust in the competence and integrity of licensees and to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, close quote. The board is required, among many things, to investigate consumer complaints and to enforce both the standards of the industry as it pertains to the quality of construction, as well as the agreements entered into by the contractor. If the investigation results in a finding that the contractor has failed to live up to the promises they made in their contract, the board is required to enforce the contract or otherwise provide that the consumer be made whole, at least for the first four years after completion of the project. And there's the issue. In 2019, however, the 80th legislature passed AB 440, which clarified and strengthened the law pertaining to residential builders and, and should they fail to provide a finished product according to the contract agreements and the bill inst instituted a requirement for a builder's warranty. The legislation mandates that warranties be written, that they run for at least one year from completion of the work, and that they be transferable to a subsequent purchaser of the residence. But that bill didn't address the other end of the warranty and did not mandate that the contractor be held to honor this warranty for the entirety of its stated life. Again, all reputable contractors uphold their warranties. And unfortunately, there are some consumers who stretch the truth as to a possible defect, but that's the purpose of an investigation. If the board finds that the consumer is at fault or that the contractor's warranty is not implicated, the contractor need not do more. However, the law turns a blind eye after just four years. Thus, because the law limits the ability of the contractor's board to act to four years, shady contractors convince a consumer with a long warranty only to walk away knowing it's unlikely they will face significant consequences. The families who brought this issue to my attention suffered through this very situation. Two were for pool solar heating contractors and the rest were for remodeling projects. Each were sold on warranties ranging in length from six to 11 years. And in each instance, they had consistent problems with their projects only to have the contractors refuse to honor the warranty after four years. And the contractors board dismissed the case for want of jurisdiction. When the families turned to either the small claims or justice courts, they were denied relief because the contractors board couldn't take action. Each had to hire another contractor to come and fix the problem at that homeowner's expense. And this is grossly unfair and arguably violative of the legislative declaration of 1981. Currently, NRS 624-3016 sub 12 states that failure to provide and honor a builder's warranty is grounds for disciplinary action by the board. But then NRS 624.331 curtails the board's ability to enforce section 3016 after just four years. I believe this was an oversight in AB 440, or at least a mistake in practical terms. Senate Bill 254 simply makes possible and indeed mandates the board's enforcement of the warranties imposed by AB 440 and those offered by remodel and pool contractors that exceed four years. I also wanna note that we provided a conceptual amendment requested uh, and, and it's in um, uh, uh, Nellis as an amendment by the Southern Nevada Home Builders Association, but I acknowledge that was an assumption on my part. It was by a member who didn't intend to represent the association, 
But uh, in any event, it was proposed uh, uh, and a, an amendment that reduces the burden on the contractors board and the contractors themselves by providing limitations on the scope of the investigation to the terms of the warranty or contracts. Also, the contractors board requested an, an amendment clarifying that in section one, subsection two, uh, which is at the bottom of uh, page one, the citation on line eight should be to NRS 624-301 sub five to clarify that the bill only applies to warranties offered. In working with the various stakeholders prior to bringing the bill, we heard some contractors and their representatives express concerns that extending the contractor's board's enforcement requirement to the length of the stated warranty will cost their businesses significant money. Others express concern that the board will require contractors to address concerns beyond the scope of their agreements, and the amendment ad amendments address these concerns. Another complaint was that uh, was that of false warranty claims. And I will say in my decades in construction development uh, and as in my conversations with the stakeholders, uh, it was generally acknowledged that false warranty claims were the exception and not the rule, though they do happen. Most home buyers are happy with their homes, especially from the builders and contractors that compete for the coveted JD Power and Associates Award. They bend over backwards to please their buyers. The fact is the contractors that honor their warranties for the length they promised will not be affected by this change at all. Similarly, those contractors that feel they cannot afford to honor a long warranty need not offer them at all. In my conversations with the contractors board, though it's hard to estimate how many cases this might mean and they are continuing to review that, they did acknowledge and I think it's generally understood that this bill will not appear at the outset to significantly burden the contractors board or the contractors. This bill simply addresses the small number of unethical contractors and the status quo. In other words, their ability to bait the consumer into buying the warranty, then refusing to honor the warranty when the board stops looking over their shoulder. In any event, the limitations on the contractors board's ability to enforce contract or warranties really violates the very purpose of the board itself to protect the public confidence and trust in the competence and integrity of licensees. I'd now like to turn to my co-presenter, Mr. Warren Hardy, who is a former Senator and President of the Associated Builders and Contractors in Southern Nevada, who will present this from the contractor side of the issue. After Mr. Hardy's remarks, uh, we can simply walk the bill, uh, walk the committee through the simple bill. Uh, Mr. Hardy. Uh, thank you, um, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Warren Hardy, today representing the Associated Builders and Contractors of Nevada. I, I spoke to Senator Pickard about this, Madam Chair, and, and as I took this issue back to my members, I was surprised to learn that this is a thing. Um, I, I had heard of insta individual instances of this type of thing occurring, uh, but as I talked to our members, uh, it, it became uh, obvious to me that it's a problematic issue. And from our perspective, uh, Senator Pickard's right, uh, Madam Chair, the, the, the reputable companies honor their warranties and they offer warranties based on their ability to honor those warranties. And it's just a, a despicable practice that there are people out there, particularly I think in the area of solar and in uh, pools and other areas where they offer long uh, warranties uh, for the purpose of getting the job when really they have no intention of honoring those warranties because of this limitation uh, that restricts the ability of homeowners, uh, unsuspecting homeowners who may make a decision uh, to buy based on that. And, and I know I know that happens a lot. I, interestingly enough, I purchased a motorcycle this weekend and I bought one that was essentially identical to the other uh, different brands, but I made the decision based solely on the fact that one had a two-year warranty and one had a one-year warranty. Uh, I'd be very much dismayed as a consumer to go back and find out they never had intention of honoring that two-year warranty since that's what I primarily based my decision on. So I know it happens a lot. Um, so I'd like to believe, Madam Chair, that I represent uh, the good actors in the industry who, who believe that warranties should be taken seriously. And to the extent that we don't have provisions in law to help enforce that, 
I, I think this legislation is helpful. I won't belabor the point, Madam Chair, but appreciate the opportunity to speak and I appreciate uh, Senator Pickard allowing me to weigh in on this. Thank you, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator. And, and uh, I'll just end uh, this piece with the statement that you, the, the bulk of the contractors that are operating in this space are reputable, they honor their warranties, and the limitation in uh, NRS 624-331 really provides an incentive, a, a perverse incentive to those that don't uh, have the intention of uh, honoring their warranties to offer a long warranty in order to take advantage of exactly what Senator Hardy just described, that tendency on the part of consumers to look for the longer warranty, and then they know that they're not going to be pursued, uh, or if they are, they, they only have one lawsuit to deal with instead of the potential loss of their license. And thus, it's a perverse incentive that is quick amendment will simply resolve and hopefully disincentivize those actors who do not offer or honor their warranties. And with that, we're prepared to stand for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, committee members, any questions? don't see any hands. Madam Chair. No, okay. Um, Madam, hi, Madam Chair, this is Senator Lang. So, um, Senator Pickett, Pickett, I wanna thank you for bringing this bill forward because far too often people that have warranty issues um, and they spend all this money to have something done and a pool is a really great example and something goes wrong and then they don't, can't do anything about it and they've spent $20,000. So um, I thank you for um, bringing this forward. So um, how, but I just like to ask like, uh, how um, will people be informed that they ha can make this action, take this action? And thank you for the uh, uh, question, Senator Lang. Keith Pickard for the record. I think you raise a really <laughs> good point. And that is that um, most people don't know that uh, the uh, opportunity exists for recovery through the contractor's board until they have a problem. And what happens in this instance is, uh, particularly if you have, and, and the common refrain was, they had a contractor who would come back and address the problem, but they wouldn't really fix it. They would you know, throw another Band-Aid on it or they would do something that wouldn't really fix the underlying problem. And this would string out over a period of time. And then when they uh, go past the four years and that's four years from completion of the work, not four years from the end of the warranty. So if they are able to go say they have a six year warranty, they go four years in, then they start having a problem. Then the uh, uh, contractor will come out and do something just to take it past that four year mark. Now the contractor's board is actually robbed of jurisdiction. They can't help because the limitation in NRS 624-331, uh, now there's no remedy. And then they think, okay, well, uh, what am I gonna do next? Typically they'll get the word, well, you're gonna have to go to court to do this. And so they'll go to small claims or they'll go to the justice court. And because the justice court sees that the Nevada contractors board didn't take action, they say, well, if the contractors board isn't getting into this, neither will we, they dismiss the case. And the, uh, the, the customer is left without a remedy. And so what all this does is it allows the contractors board to enforce the contractor's warranty whenever that ends. And so uh, ultimately the consumer is protected by this. The reality is that this doesn't happen on a daily basis, fortunately, but it happens enough that there will hopefully be just enough incentive by eliminating this limitation that these contractors won't offer the warranty, that long warranty in the first place, because they know that uh, the contractor's board is looking over their shoulder. Remember, contractors are generally more afraid of the contractor's board than a lawsuit because a lawsuit might cost them a couple thousand dollars. Getting sideways with the contractor's board might cost them their livelihood. Right, so Senator Pickard, I uh, refer to Lang for the record. I'm just wondering if, you know, when you, 
a pool is a really good example, so I'll go back to that. You get all this paperwork after you've had your pool work done. I'm just wondering when they get their warranty information is if they could get a piece of paper that would also tell them um, if something went wrong, the steps they could take. That's a great idea. And frankly, that's something that the contractors board addresses with pool contractors and contracts all the time. If you look at the regulations, they spell out what it is the contractor is supposed to provide. And uh, um, if the contractor's board is willing, uh, they can certainly uh, put that in their regulations. We don't have to insert language in this bill. Not that I'm opposed to doing it, but they're hopefully here and, and going to be uh, uh, weighing in and they can answer that as well. Oh, Keith Pickard for the record, sorry. Additional questions, committee? Okay, so we'll go to the phones now and um, four, and there will be 15 minutes and two minutes uh, per individual. And please remember that if someone has already covered um, the essence of what you want to say, it's okay to say ditto. Uh, that way we can get more people on um, during each segment. So 15 minutes, two minutes per person. Uh, broadcast, let's open up the lines. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 252, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in support of SB 252, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 116, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Alexis Motorex, A-L-E-X-I-S-M-O-T-A-R-E-X with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors representing the commercial construction industry in Northern Nevada. AGC was opposed to the bill as drafted, but can support with the adoption of the amendment proposed by the State Contractors Board. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Again, we are currently on support of SB 252. To testify in support, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers left in support at this time. Okay, let's go to opposition. 15 minutes, two minutes per person. To testify in opposition of SB 252, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in opposition of SB 252, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. We'll go to neutral, same time. To testify neutral on SB 252, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 139, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Spearman and committee members. Misty Grimmer, G-R-I-M-M-E-R, -M -M -E with the Ferraro Group representing the Nevada State Contractors Board. Um, we were not told to be available for questions, so unfortunately, you just have me today, not my smart folks from, from the Contractors Board, but we will work on all the questions that were brought up today. Um, we were able to have a conversation with Senator Pickard about the goals of SB 252, and we appreciate his goal of eliminating the opportunity for bad actors to not adhere to the agreements they signed, thinking that they're off the hook once the statute of limitations is passed. Warranties can cover workmanship and or the materials and equipment. The role of the contractor's board is specific to the workmanship, not materials or equipment. Sometimes the distinction of if the failure was caused by workmanship versus the materials or equipment is not easy to determine. We will continue working with the Senator to clarify the role of the contractor's board with respect to when a contractor is not meeting their workmanship obligations set forth in the warranty. Thank you, Chair Spearman. Thank you, caller. 
Again, we are currently in neutral testimony on SB 252. To testify neutral, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers neutral at this time. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pickard, do uh, you have any closing comments? I uh, won't belabor the point, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate the committee's time and attention. I will say that the uh, contractors board was very helpful in discussing the framework of the bill. Um, and uh, Ms. Grimmer is correct that they uh, focus on the workmanship uh, and the contracting uh, and the promises that are made. So I appreciate their uh, input. And uh, if anyone has any additional questions, I'm always available. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and with that, we will close the hearing <clears throat> on Senate Bill 252. And we'll open it up now for public comment. If you would like to speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, your line is open and working and you have no callers at this time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so we will close out public comment and um, we're getting ready to adjourn this marathon session. We'll be right back again tomorrow at eight o'clock. And as you can see, we're working feverishly to make sure that we can get all the bills um, that have come to us, get them out. Uh, if you have an amendment, if you're waiting on a conceptual amendment, I would encourage you to make sure you get that into uh, our committee sooner rather than later. Uh, we're making making the agenda for Thursday and Friday, and it will be a long one. So we need to make sure uh, that we've got all of the amendments in for the bills that we will be considering. And so with that, uh, we will adjourn and I will see you all tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Thank you.